Welcome to the One Life One Chance podcast. I'm your host, Toby Morse. I have a very special guest today and a co-host. My co-host is Adam Blake from H2O. Say what's up, Adam. Hello, everybody. And my guest today is Craig Satari from Queens, New York. You may know him from his work from the bands such as Straight Ahead, Youth of Today, Rest in Pieces, Agnostic Front, Sick of It All, Creep Division, and he also plays live with the Cro-Mags. Welcome to the podcast, uh, Craig Satari, Craig Ahead. What's up? How's it going? Good. Thanks How for having you? me. Good, um, good to see you guys. It's been a minute. I know. It's been a long time. A couple of days out in LA, relax, hang out with my friends. Yes. A couple would, of coffees like 10 minutes ago. Eat some good food. I would say that Craig has the um, longest resume in hardcore. Best resume in hardcore? Definite, definite candidate, I would say. I played in a lot of bands. Yeah. You know? I th- can we add? We can add live bass for Madball back in the day? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not really, no. Did yeah. you play bass live for Madball back well, in the day? When Madball was an idea, I was the the bass player but when they actually recorded i showed up about 90 minutes two hours late to the recording session at don fury's and uh when i showed up they were like vinnie's like kid we kicked you out of the band you're too late roger's gonna play bass let, but, oh, but, but, but let but let him use red so my, <laughs> my red bass is on the first mad Bull recording so oh, wow. so what happened was i stepped back and myself and mark ryan we wound up singing backups because mark ryan came with me an hour and a half late shout out to mark ryan mark super, ryan what's mark up ryan, super touch my man searching for the light searching yep. for the light so before we get into where you're at now with your life, because you've been doing this a really long time, let's get back to like Queens. Um, you were born in Queens, correct? Yeah, home of the Ramones. Home of the Ramones. Murphy's Law. Yes, and uh, many, Spider-Man. many others. Spider-Man. Token Entry, many Token many Entry others. too. Yes, sir, Token many Entry. others, many others. So how were you in school? Uh, uh, going to school, I, you know, I had, I had like uh, an inability to focus and concentrate. I, uh, my IQ was high. My test scores were really high. But I, I had uh, some type of problem with focusing for a long period of time, yeah. and I think that was because I had a, a, a my childhood at ho- my, my, my home life was kind of crazy when I was young. You know, okay. My father was a, a police officer and an alcoholic. Didn't know that he was actually uh, investigated for being a mob hitman while he was a cop, but never indicted. Holy there's there's all yeah there's all kinds of crazy stories. He he. Uh, he single-handedly set the woman's movement back six years. That's a whole other story, though. He was like a real, you know, piece of work. A real piece of work. But you know, oh, I, you know, shit. God bless his soul. He's passed away now. I'm not trying to insult the man. I'm just telling, telling it how I remember it. But um, so I had childhood trauma. Okay. You know what I mean? I saw crazy things when I was very, very young. Brothers and sisters. I have a. Uh, I grew up with my mother and my brother. My mother and brother. We were the three of us were a very tight and loving family unit. Yeah. But my my alcoholic father was swirling around when I was very young, and it was kind of like really scary stuff going on. You know Damn. what I mean? I saw like real extreme violence, guns shoved in my mother's mouth, the cops showing up and being like, you know, Rocky, put the gun away. Don't make us come back here. Come on, we don't we don't want this to be in the paper. Meanwhile, my mother's a bloody mess. And I'm Holy three. Shit. I'm three years old, four years old, seeing this. You know what I mean? Crying like, wow. what do I do? You know what I mean? Like crazy wow, stuff. A lot, a lot but so, yeah. so I had this inability to concentrate in school, and I had these. Uh, I was very aggressive as a little kid, but at the yeah. same time, I was extremely introverted. So I, I, I would go hyper, but then when I was in public, I would go really quiet. Mm-hmm. I had this private hyperactivity and then this real quiet thing shy thing in public so uh so yeah school was tough but they kept putting me in the 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 special classes meaning like the the intelligent classes the sp they called it advanced classes but then i wouldn't do any of my work and they'd be like why aren't you doing your work like your writing is so nice you you, your math scores were so high and i'd just be like "Uh, what like I, i i just couldn't really focus and that's why I'm a hardcore guy today. <laughs> I, think that, I think that's a pretty common story for a lot of people. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of the way it goes. There was something something twisted in there, you know what I mean? But um I don't really have those problems now, not that I notice. Maybe did I you, maybe I do. I did know. you did you play sports in school? No, not really. I was uh, when I was little I played I played baseball. Yeah. You know, I liked baseball a lot. So I used when that's I was a little kid, I played baseball. You know, I'd play games in my in the kids in my, in my neighborhood, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so I was in little league and I loved baseball. It was a sport that I really liked as a kid. Handball. Handball, I played handball growing up in Queens. Stickball, yeah. obviously. Stickball, yeah. You know, a little bit of basketball. You know, I wasn't like a super athlete or anything like that, but I was like a regular kid in the what neighborhood. A- I was kind of small and skinny. I was very light, and most of the kids in my neighborhood were older. So in in, those, in sports, I had a little trouble in my neighborhood, but then when I would play in leagues, I would do okay. Yeah. What was the first music you fell in love with? 
Uh, it's hard to say, really. I mean, when I was really little, uh, my mother would play stuff in the house, like 70s hits, Glenn yeah. Campbell and stuff like Some that. Too, Adam. Stuff smart. like that, I dug, you know what I mean? Whatever yeah. I would hear. And then, uh, I mean, you know, that Grease, that the, the movie Grease. Right, movie. I loved that soundtrack when I was a little, little kid. I just thought the songs were really good. Yeah. And then right around the same time, I discovered Black Sabbath. My brother, Sick. actually, my oh. brother and his friend Lyman, on a rainy day, they locked me in Lyman's room, right? So they locked me in Lyman's room and they put on the first Sabbath album, you know, with the with the rain and everything. Yeah. And they, 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 they grabbed my arm and they stuck a needle in my arm filled with water and they said it was heroin. I was six years old. What? And, and yeah, they pretended they were shooting heroin and then they, they kind of forced and they stuck me with the needle and I was crying hysterically like I'm going to die. And then as soon as they <laughs> stuck the needle in my arm, like just in my skin and like pushed the needle a little bit. They shut the lights and locked me in the room with the first Sabbath record on. So I cried and was banging on the door. Holy and, shit. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. It was traumatic. That's you know? so traumatic. Yeah, it's like, it was like, it was like 1975 or six or whatever. I mean, on the one hand, they're the worst <laughs> friends ever. But on the other hand, they did introduce you to Black Sabbath. <laughs> it so. did, yeah, it's kind of like a <laughs> double-edged sword. So what happened was I, uh, when they finally let me out of the room, I was crying. I ran home. And then the next week, I you know, like knocked on Lyman's door. And my brother and him were hanging out. And I was like, oh, I want to listen to it again. I was oh, like, I'm not going to cry this time, I promise. And they were like, all right, come on in. And they played me the whole record, and I was like, "That's amazing." into it, you know what I mean? Holy shit. So did you end up graduating from high school, or you got in bands? I, I, I was in bands. I wound up going to high school, and then when I was in 10th grade, I actually stopped going to high school to go on Youth of Today tour. Okay. So it was a tour out west, and then uh, it was actually a tour down south originally, where I, it was during school time. So I, I got my GED, and my mother's like, what are you doing? Finish school, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, I'm going to get my GED and go on tour. She was wow. like, why are you doing this? But then she, she understood. And when she saw what I did, you know, in the end, she always supported me. Yeah. She always su like, gave me like total love and support. So she was into the idea that I was into music because she was, uh, what I found out later in life was my mother, when she was very young, left Germany and started traveling all over the place when she was like 18 and she was traveling and going to places she was working for the for the royal family in england as a nanny so she could Holy see england shit. and then she came to america and she wanted to explore america uh and then what happened was my father who was a cop happened to meet her when she got off the plane at the airport he was a cop at jfk or actually back then it was uh probably Idlewild Airport, I okay. guess. So he was there and he was like, hey, what are you doing? And he like charmed her and wound up taking her on a date. So, Holy you shit. know, as much as that messed up her being the traveler, because she has the travel gene like I do, the, yeah. the, you know, the, the wanderer thing. But it got totally cut off by meeting him and having two kids, which she probably didn't want to do. But, you know, at the same time, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. So Wow. So how did you even find the guys in Youth of Today? How did you get into the punk rock path? From um you know, I was young. It was like 1980, and uh, my brother had a friend that I was in uh, grade school. I was in like fifth grade or sixth, fifth grade, I think I was. I was 10 years old, and my brother went to started going to high school like ninth grade. So my brother had music class with this with Danny Lilker. You know who yeah, that yeah. is? So, Legend. So Danny Lilker was, um, you know, he already had been playing for a few years he started playing really young as well so he would come to my house for lunch and he was friends with my brother and he was like really nice so he'd come in the house and i'd be like hey what's up what's your deal man you got the long hair i was like what's yeah. your story he's like you know i'm into music blah, blah blah i'm like you like sabbath you like aerosmith he's like i like you like the who he goes yeah i love that stuff <laughs> so he's like you know check this out and he gives me like a motorhead record or whatever you know Damn. and i'm like oh this is great you know what i mean and he's like yeah check this out and he gives me like uh whatever he gives me he gave me a bunch of like rock metal type stuff at first and then he brought over a bass and he was like saying to my brother he goes hey we're going to start a band called anthrax and you we, i want you to play bass because i want to play guitar instead of bass oh, so he was shit. teaching my brother bass but i was the only one that cared about it so i would play all day you know what i mean and figure stuff out and be like hey when you come over lunch danny check this out i figured this out and he'd be like oh that's good yeah you got it right okay you know figure this part out next i'm like that part's hard he's like i'll give you an idea the key changes to this and i'd be like you know what I mean? And he explained to me wow. how scales work and keys and how you switch. The rough, he explained the rough rudiment of it and then I just yeah. took it from there. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, my brother wasn't too, my brother played a little bit, he wasn't that interested so I wound up picking up the bass and then by like 1982, it was punk rock. Yeah. You know what I mean? 80, 80 to 82 was like metal stuff and rock stuff and then it, you know, turned into the exploited and... And then you went to study kind of shows? 
Uh, yeah, for I listened up like punk and hardcore for like two years. I got my hands on everything I could get my hands on. Eighty two yeah. and eighty three, I just was all over it. And I started playing in a band in eighty three, a local neighborhood band. And we did like covers. We did like Motorhead songs. We did an exploited song. And uh we did like a, a sh one show, like a battle of the bands. Came, yeah. came in second place, set the tone <laughs> for my career. I always use that line. But the band that won was like the pe rich parents who rented the PA, mm. those kids' band. So, uh, and it turns out Armand, Pete, and Lou were the roadies for that show because we asked no Armand way, to play in the dude. band. And this is how I met Pete and Lou and Armand. The drummer for that band lived a block away from Pete and Lou. Gotcha. So when we would rehearse, those guys would come out and they were like, hey, this is Pete, this is Lou. And I met a bunch of other people. And then one day Armand came down and they wanted him to play guitar, but we were playing a first show at a church. So he was like, it's hypocritical for me to play a church. I won't do it. Because uh -oh. he was like anti-religion. Wow, respect. Yeah, he was old. You know, he was like a metal punk guy. Yeah, back yeah, then. yeah. It was like this was like 1982, probably. Yeah, long hair too. I remember. Yeah, this is probably like the end of '82. So we got Victor from Reagan Youth to play guitar. You know, Vic Venom. Yeah, I know the name. Yeah, we got him to play yeah. guitar, and we played the one gig, and that band broke up. And um, so right around, right after that gig. I was saying to Danny Looker and to Pete and Lou, I was like, you know, I would talk to them once in a while. I was like, I want to go to shows. And they're like, yeah, you know, you got to go all the way downtown you yeah. know, school and we got to find a day when it's, you know what I mean? Like, and Danny would say the same thing. So like most of 83 went by where I didn't go to a show. How old were you then? Eight, uh, how old were you then? 13? 13? Yeah, yeah. So like 83, I was like trading tapes with people. I would like write people and they'd send me like a tape. Sick. You know what I mean? Like tape trading all over the world and stuff like that to get stuff, trading like seven inches and stuff pre -internet. like that. Pre-internet. Yeah, like pre-internet, like write, you write to somebody and they send you their demo. You send them like your that. stuff. So then uh, 83 was pretty much me listening to, to, to radio shows. and uh, What was that radio show? I remember I was going to go to a show in 83. It was uh, uh, Ernie's earlier band was playing the Coventry. Oh, shit, before Token Entry. Yeah, uh, Gilligan's Revenge. Yeah. And I was like, let's go to this show, but it didn't work out because I, you know, I couldn't get there and I had like yeah. homework to do and stuff like that. So uh, 83 slips by and I'm listening to punk and getting into it all, you know what I mean? And uh, then 84 comes and I go to my first show. How did you find these people to trade tapes with? That's true. Good you question. buy like a, a, you would get like a, a, a mag, like a fanzine. Maximum Rock and Roll get or something? Hand, or yeah, like, yeah, fanzines, yeah. yeah, all stuff like that. You know what I mean? Whatever yeah. fanzines you could get your hand on were at send the a local dollar record store, camera. send a dollar. You, mm -hmm. you know, you talk to somebody you know over there and they go, hey, write to this guy. And they give you the address and you write to him and he sends you something. Like, it was like, that's the way it worked back then. It's totally trustworthy too back then too. Yeah, it took oh, a it's couple on a weeks. system, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was like cool. And then boom, it, it took built weeks up. too to get shit though. Weeks, it built up like that. You know, yeah. it was like, you had to really want it. You know what I mean? And yeah, so I remember. Yeah. So you're 13 years old. You hadn't tried drinking or smoking or nothing. You weren't like no, a party no, or nothing? Yeah, I tried. Okay. Sure. I, I, like, uh, the first time I smoked pot, I was six. Oh, Jesus Christ, so the guys, son. The guys in my neighborhood were like uh, my brother's friends. They all, this is the 70s. Is this the kids that pretended to inject you with heroin? Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. <laughs> those kids. Yeah, that guy used to smoke pot all the time. You know what I mean? So like, dr dr and back in those days, growing up in New York, everybody got high and drunk. Yeah. Drugs were all over the place. So I would like, I started smoking pot young, you know, really Damn. 12. I started smoking pot regularly at 11 or 11, I'd say. And I would drink Crazy. beer and some liquor and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like I, I was into like getting high. I was like a burnout kid. <laughs> you know, I was into music. And then years, you had long hair too. Uh, long hair, yeah. Probably yeah. till I was about fourteen. Yeah. You know, like like white trash, mm -hmm. dirt, dirt, <laughs> white trash dirt bag style. You know, like like you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a fucking Motorhead dirt bag. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so then, how soon after that did you find start going to shows? 84, 84 I started going okay. to shows 14. I started going to shows in 84 and uh, first show I went to um, I go with Danny and another guy and um, you know you had to take the train in it was yeah. actually a night show at CB's so I go in and uh, Big Charlie's there Big Charlie Hankins rest his rest soul peace, yeah. and uh, the way I knew Big Charlie was I left this part out earlier Big Charlie would come to uh, my house for lunch Gotcha. Because my brother was an alternate on the Bayside High School football team. So Big Charlie was like the star of the team. So like, and he knew Danny also because he was into punk. Yeah. So Danny was into hardcore and metal and punk and so was Big Charlie. So Big Charlie would come over my house and my mother would make lunch. My mother would be like, oh, Charlie's here. I have to make 20 sandwiches now. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> the guy was so big. So, um, so when I went to my first show, I walk in and Charlie's there. 
And I'm like, Charlie, what are you doing? He goes, kid, kid, come here. He goes, you know, in between bands. He goes, everybody he grabs me on the stage at CB's. He goes, everybody, you see this kid? This is my friend. This is my friend. He's a good friend of mine. He goes, he's a good kid. And everybody's like, hey, what's up? So I met everybody. I met Stigma. I met wow. everybody. And uh, the whole show, I danced on his shoulders, and I was like moshing the whole show. And I was like, it was my first show. That's great. That's awesome. awesome. So he awesome. took you on stage and publicly presented you to there was only the like, there was There was like 50 or 60 people at the show. Back then, it was like yeah. a small show. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it was cool. And That's then, dope. you know, and I knew everybody. And then, like, I was going, as soon as I went to my first show, every week I went went to Matt yeah, had to go every Sunday. Yeah. And as soon as I went, within like two or three weeks, I met like Tommy Carroll. He just started going to shows, and I met all these people. And, you know, I started like, hey, I play bass. Hey, come jam with us. Come jam with us. Come jam with us. And everybody was like, "Oh, you can really play?" Because I practiced all the time. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, "Yeah, I know how to play." You're waiting you know for I mean? this moment for years, like not going into the city at home. This at home tapes. practicing, yeah, listening yeah, to tapes. Ready, because yeah. at that point, I didn't have money to go into the city. Yeah, I had nothing. Plus, I was like 13. It's kind of like I'm gonna go out. I'm, you know, the danger spec by myself yeah. into the city and like, you know, early 80s. It's like I didn't really have the connection, you know. But by the time I was 14, it was like I could go anywhere I want. I mean, at 13, I could go anywhere I want to, but it was like... The, the city might have been a bridge too far. Yeah, I'm like I'm like going out and riding my bike all night. You know what I mean? Kind yeah. of going out. You know what I mean? This was like buses and trains and you're on the Lower East Side. You know what I mean? Yeah, different, different, different world. Thing, you know what I mean? That's cool. Your mom was so open-minded about yeah, it Yeah, she too. was cool about it. So then the first band, what is it? The first band practice. Like who we end up jamming with first? Uh, I played in that local neighborhood band yeah. when I was like probably 13 or something like that. But then like in the 12, city band, 13. like a... Like, like a uh, established band i started playing with with tommy had that band nyc mayhem with gordon and some other guy and tommy was like listen these guys are playing like crossover metal i don't want to play that i want to play like hardcore type stuff yeah so i was like listen they, they said we're gonna kick this guy out you want to jam with us okay so they kicked the guy out and we jammed a bunch and we put together some new material we kept a few of the older songs and we that nyc mayhem band yeah and then we started we like right away as soon as i joined them we had a gig right away we played like the the we played the anthrax club in connecticut the, the first anthrax that was a tiny little basement we played there with mental abuse that was like in, in 84 at some point and then uh and then we played cbs and i think that that was in 84 as well and uh, we played that show, and then we just started playing. Mental Abuse loved us, so we'd always play with them in Jersey, Connecticut. And then uh, we played CBs with the Psychos. Psychos, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were like, uh, it was us and the Psychos, and Token Entry was on that bill, yeah. and so was uh, the Numbskulls. And that was like 85, but sometime in 85. And uh, all throughout 84 and 85, that Mayhem Band just played tri-state area shows, tons yeah. of them. We play like every month, every two weeks. You know what I mean? It's constantly playing. I whatever. mean, so you you left school so early, you didn't have you were too young to get a job. So you just kind of hanging. No, but at that point I was in school. Okay. At that point I was I didn't okay. stop going to high school until eighty six. Okay. So I would go to school and just do weekend gigs. I get my brother's friends to drive me, <laughs> however we awesome. could get to drive us. Like I'd I'd be like, yeah. Joe, take me to I got to play out in like Dover, New Jersey. Damn. He'd be like, what? I'd be like, you got a car, take me. All right, kid, I'll take you. What, it's the music thing? All right, yeah, that's good. You keep doing that, kid. You're good at that, you know? So my brother's friends would take me. And then, I met, then when I got a little, oh, probably 85, I met this guy, God rest his soul, Tony Carangelo, unpredictable Tony. He was a friend of mine. <laughs> so when I, first, when I was like uh, maybe 15, I met him. And I was just going to high school, and he was a, a year or two older, and he was my friend, and he was like, yeah, I like some of that stuff. You know, he's like, I like DRI. I was like, well, check this shit out if you like that. You know what I mean? Turned him on to Minor Threat, The Bad Brains. He was like, oh, shit. So I, so I was in a band, and he was like, yo, let me go to your shows. He started coming to the shows with his friend Elvis. So then he would drive, <laughs> he would drive me to the shows, you know? His friend Elvis, that's awesome. Was there any other plan apart from music at that point, or was it just, I'm I playing music for life, that's I'm it? Just, I, I don't know about for life. I was like, this is what I, that's all I cared about. Yeah. I would come home from school. I would play the bass. I would listen to stuff. I would listen to stuff. I would write riffs. I would play the bass. I would figure songs out. Do it all day. All day, stop to eat, play the bass, play the bass, listen to songs, write a, write a song, call awesome. somebody. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. I got this idea. You know what I mean? Yeah, okay. Blah, blah, blah. That's all I cared about. That's all I did. Damn. That's it. So what came first, straight ahead or um, you today? Straight ahead was, so I started playing in that, mayhem band yeah. and we played a bunch of shows in like uh 84 to 85 you know yeah and then uh the summer of 85 ends and 
mayhem breaks up because Gordon was like, you know, you guys want to play like this minor threat hardcore stuff. I don't want to do that. I want to play metal. So we were like, oh, okay, shit. we're like, okay, that's cool. You know? And, uh, so Tommy was like, I'll sing. So we'll get another drummer. So I was hanging out at C I said, I have a guitar player. I had Rob that played in, yeah, Rest Rob, in pieces, pieces and, yeah. and helmet. And Rob was in this band smegma with me probably in 83 right right before mayhem and we used to i used to take the train to corona queens go to his basement and play with him and richie who was the first bass player for sick of it all oh they shit. were Cipriano. two two guitar players so we had this band that we played stuff and it was like crossover type stuff punk and metal kind of mixed you know really fast stuff really kind of kind of fast like real smashing kind of yeah. stuff and uh so i said i got this guy rob he'll play guitar he's really good so I'm telling this to Armand outside one day. I go, yeah, we got to get a drummer. You know, we're going to get robbed. He knew Rob. I said, we're going to get robbed to play guitar. He goes, I'll play drums. I go, you don't play drums. <laughs> he goes, uh, I'll get some sticks and I'll give it a shot. I was like, all right, so we'll rehearse. Damn. I said, in two weeks, we're going to rehearse. He goes, okay, okay. So I think what he did was he like went to his friend's house and like played his friend's drums after school, like a bunch of times over those two weeks where we said we're going to rehearse in two weeks. Yeah. So he started practicing like the drums. And uh, so we rehearsed with him, and he played okay. He knew he knew the material. Yeah, you know, the, he, we did a couple of old Mayhem songs, and I was like, we, you know, we'll do this cover and mess around. And he played, and he was okay. So we That's were awesome. like, we were like, all right. And then we had a, so we said, okay, so we're gonna take this gig at CB's, and we're gonna go under the name Straight Ahead. I didn't like the name Straight Ahead at yeah. first because back then I was still getting high. Gotcha. So I was like, kind of like, that's kind of weird. You know what I mean? It's just like I don't want to be a straight edge band. You know what I mean? It was Tommy like, was straight edge though back then. Yeah, yeah it's just like yeah. this is like the fall of '85, I guess. Yeah. So um. So so uh, we played CBs as Straight Ahead, and Tommy sang, and, and Rob played guitar, and Armand played drums, and I played bass. So that's how Straight Ahead started. That's amazing. What came and next? Then, and then uh, I was, Youth, Straight Ahead was playing, and I remember Ray Ray came to see, Ray and Purcell came to see Youth of Today, uh, Straight Ahead play CBs probably in the spring of 86. We already played a couple gigs, and he came to see us at CBs, and he danced to every song, sang along. Wow. He had, he had the, the tape or whatever, the demo. And uh, so after that, like he's, you know, I guess Tommy was uh, tried playing drums, tried out playing drums for Youth of Today. Oh, shit. And then he said, then he wrote me a letter like, hey, I want you to join with me and John and Tommy and play bass. You know, you're. What's your letter? Yeah. That's like great. Wrote awesome. You, he wrote, me a, wrote you a like letter. a three page, four page letter. I have it wow, somewhere at home. It's like, a, you know, we can do great things together. Imagine the people we can reach, blah, blah, blah. All four of us with the same ideas, blah, blah, blah. That's fucking. And uh, I like hardcore and I like the, I like music. I like, yeah. you know, and, and I liked Youth of Today. I had the seven inch and I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, this is kind of like minor thready kind of hardcore. I was like, yeah. I'm into it. I was like, I'll play in your band, but I wasn't straight edge or anything. But hanging out with those guys, they, they were like, why would you smoke pot? What's the point? And I was like, well, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no. And they kind of got me into like the whole. Some persuasive dudes right but there. But no, but it was, they would, they would just, at that point, it was like, why would you get high? Why aren't you like commanding your own reality? And I was like, damn. Yeah. But I was a shy little kid. I was like, yeah. yeah. I was like, you know something? You're right. And I tried it and I did it. And it, it helped me a lot. And how, so how I got a great benefit from playing with youth of today. People think, oh, it was a trend. It was this. I was a little like kid from Queens getting high with bad influences left over you. from the 70s yeah. and tra trauma from childhood. So like once I found like, hey, I, I could take command of my own reality, that was a start to me becoming, coming out of my shell and being who I was. You know what I mean? That's awesome. That's powerful lesson. Powerful lesson. That was a crazy tour you guys did too. Richie was talking about Empress when he came out Defenders and played and all those shit. That Cali run you guys did back then. Um, it was you, the Richie lineup. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, Fenders. Five, okay, five I remember that. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And Murphy's Law was touring with the Beastie Boys. Yeah. So we went to that show and then the next day we played with Murphy's Law at Fenders. Yep, I remember that. We spent the whole summer staying at uh, Dan O'Mahony's house. Wow. In Orange County. So That's we like, answer. And we stayed at his house and as, as, at a certain point his parents were like, these guys have been here for months. They got to go. Damn. So then we stayed in, uh, uh, what's his name? The guitar player for, uh, come on. We stayed in his garage. Inside Out? No. His father didn't want us staying in the house, so we stayed in his garage. And I would oh, walk shit. and pick oranges every day and lemons. That's but, uh, awesome, uh, man. Uh, it was a straight edge band from Chain of Strength? Day. Chain of Strength. There we go. The guitar player for Chain of Strength. Wow. We stayed there. So uh, that was a summer in California. I was young, but I was like very, I hadn't come out of my shell shelter, yet. You're very sheltered. I was very, very shy and very introverted. Dude, how old are you? I'm like 15 or 16. 
So I'm really shy. Yeah. And those guys were like, hey, Bo, they were like outgoing. They were like kind of like, they had like a little bit of a jock mentality. You know what I mean? Older today, than you guys, too, yeah. They were older. They were like, you know, graduated high school or whatever. You know what I mean? And I was still like a kid. So they were like, uh, you know, I, it taught me some lessons though. It taught me like uh, how to deal with people a little better. I don't mm -hmm. think I effectively dealt with them at that point because I was so young and so shy. I hadn't come out of my shell yet. But then after that, eventually uh, the next year I joined Agnostic Front and that's what made me Ouch. wait. That woke me up to yeah. the world is like this. Yeah. You, you got to be able to function and it, it, it brought out who I am today for the most part i feel it's a similar story boot from camp. adam going from shelter to h2o i feel it's a similar situation boot camp yeah, yeah. totally you need it 100 percent. af wow. taught me a lot af kind of manned me up you know what i mean so you were, you were telling me we spoke about this a while back that that at one point you were basically being discussed as being either in murphy's law or agnostic front and they were going to choose for you which band you were going to join right <laughs> yeah <laughs> Like Jimmy and Vinny were like deciding who they who was going to take you, like drafting you into their yeah, 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 I was being drafted, yeah. <laughs> so the way that worked was, um, so Youth of Today, I, I wound up quitting Youth of Today after, I guess after that tour on the in the West Coast. Came home, uh, I didn't really, you know, those guys, you know, like I was the outsider in that band because yeah. I was the shy little kid, totally. grew up really poor. You know what I mean? Had tr childhood trauma. So I was like different than them. I didn't fit in really. And I didn't know how to really handle myself at that point. I was still sheltered a lot, you know? Yeah. So uh, I quit that band. No hard feelings. The guys were all still my friends today. It's, you know, how, it's many just, years were, how many years were in that band? I was in that band for like a year, like okay. 86. I was in that band gotcha. from like the spring of 86 till, uh, till probably like the turn of 87, spring of 87. Gotcha. So um, I wound up uh, leaving that band, only band I ever, I ever uh, quit. Wow. So I wound up leaving that band and um, restarting Straight Ahead. So I was excited about that because I really liked Straight Ahead musically and it was fun to play. But then Tommy, we had a blowout one day at rehearsal because mm. Tommy was kind of unpredictable. You know what I mean? Yeah. He was a little like bipolar, unpredictable, wild man. He's, you know, he's my friend. I love yeah. him. But he was like hard to deal with on a daily basis. So the band broke up and I had no band. Damn. I was like, I was like, I was like I went home. I was like, shit, I have no band. So then Vinny calls me, Stigma. And he goes, he, or I see him at a show, maybe I can't remember. But he goes, listen. He goes, he goes. I want. He goes, uh, Kabula left. Or no, no, it was the guy Allen was playing. Kabula had been out, and they did that Liberty and Justice album, and they That's kicked right. him out. They kicked him out because something personal happened with them and this guy. So uh, Vinny said, listen, I because Vinny used to always tell me when I was little, he'd see like Mayhem play, and he'd be like. You're a good kid. You jump up and down. You're so energetic and you can play. <laughs> he was like, one day you're going to be in my band, kid. And I'd be like, no way. I got Agnostic Front. You guys, wow. you guys are like a, like a, you guys are like a big band. How am I going to be in Agnostic Front? He goes, listen, he goes, mark my words. One day you're going to be in my band, kid. He goes, I got my eye on you. I'd be like, okay. You know, he was really nice uh, when I was a kid. Always Fuck. very nice, Stigma. So, so then he called me up. He goes, see, kid, I always, or when I saw him maybe at a show, he goes, I always told you you'd be in my band and now you're going to be. He goes, you, you know, we need a new bass player. I want it to be you. It's going to be you. So we're going to rehearse in like two weeks or whatever. Damn. So I go, okay, great. I'm into, he goes, learn all the songs. I learned them all in one night because I knew, I kind of knew them all anyway. Yeah. But like I could figure stuff out. I'm, musically, my ear is pretty good. I can figure stuff out fast. So boom, knew everything. And then Todd, I'm hanging out one day. And, Todd uh, Youth? Todd Youth, my, my buddy, rest in peace, Todd Youth. God bless your soul. So Todd, uh, we're hanging out. I used to hang out with Todd a lot, like 86, 87. I would hang out with Todd all the time. Maybe the end of 85. I don't remember exactly when. But we were, we were buddies. We would hang out all the time. I'd sleep at Ray B's house all the time because we would hang out downtown. So Todd is like, listen, you know, uh, we need a new bass player. So I want it to be you, you know. And they go, we're going to try out this other guy, Chuck. I go, I know Chuck. Chuck's my friend. Chuck Val, rest his Some soul. Days. God bless him. What a what a great man yeah he is i'll say is because he's out there somewhere but a tragedy that he he was yeah, killed man. and uh it's a sad one i cried like a baby when that happened because he was always my friend he always used to bring amps for me so i would play cbs with straight ahead and i would have no amp and he'd call me up like a few days before the show. he'd be like listen so for the show i'm gonna bring my and i wouldn't even ask him and i'd be like no i got something he'd That's be like so he'd be like you don't have anything and i'd be like yeah i don't and he'd be like so i'm gonna bring my amp he'd like kind of force me to take his yeah. amp which was really nice you know what I mean? I would try to be like, no, I'll figure something out. Just try not to hassle him because he's such a good dude. So uh, he would always do that because he had equipment. You know, back then yeah. he had like a job, and I didn't have a job. So he had a. He was a have yeah. you ever had a job? 
Yeah, I've had tons of jobs, yeah. but we'll get into that later. <laughs> 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 I wore I worked. I worked. I worked hard. Believe me, I know about work. I'm not a, some pampered kid. No, we know that. I know you. I know. Where were we? I'm babbling on like a storm. You're talking to what band now? He's talking Gnostic Front. He's talking about getting drafted. Getting drafted. Into yeah. Agnostic Front. Right. Um, With Murphy's Law. We got to go back. I'll, I'll get wings. the story out and then we'll go back and yeah, forth yeah, yeah. a little bit. So Todd Youth. So Todd Youth says, play with us. I go, okay, great. So I go to the rehearsal and I, I, I play with him, right? And I actually, I think this is how it went. I talked to Todd. Todd said, play with us. I go to the rehearsal. It's myself and Chuck. So we both play a couple of songs. Sounds good when we both play. Chuck was a really good player. I'm a good player, you know? So we both play. Sounds great. And, it, you know, like, they're like, you know, yeah, it sounds great with both of you. Okay, like, let's, uh, you know, let's play some more. So they light up a big spliff, <laughs> and I don't smoke, but Chuck does. All okay. right. So then we play a few more songs, <laughs> and it sounds really good with both of us. And, like, uh, Todd's like, you know, they they talk for a minute. Like, yeah. me and Chuck leave the room. They talk for a few minutes. And then as I'm leaving, you know, Todd's like, listen, you know, we're going to jam with both of you again because you both did a great job. And, like, we don't really know who to pick, right? We don't yeah. know what to do. So, you know, we'll see what happens. And I'm like, all right, cool. So I go home and I used to carry my bass in a cardboard box because I didn't have a case. Yeah. So I had a big cardboard box. So I'm walking home with this cardboard. I take the train home, big cardboard box. <laughs> and uh, I'm walking up the stairs to my apartment and my mother pulls the door up and she goes, Craig, uh, Vinny Stigma's on the phone for you? And this is how it happened. Wow. So I go, I go, okay, hold on. So I go up the steps and I'm like, I put my bass on. I go, Vinny, what's up? What are you doing? He goes, listen, kid, I talked to Jimmy and Jimmy's taking the other kid and we're taking you and I told you you'd be in my band one day. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, all right, cool. And that he goes, and he goes to me, he goes, he goes, yeah, they're taking him. We're taking you. So he goes, listen, in two weeks, we're going to rehearse, learn all the songs. This is what happened. Before when I said that I saw him at a show, yeah, yeah. I couldn't remember if it was a call or that. It was a call on yeah. the way home from Murphy's Law Practice. So amazing. So then man. I saw Todd like a couple days later. Todd's like, yeah, you know, Vinny and Jimmy talked and worked it out. Jimmy, uh, Vinny really wanted you. And he goes, and he goes, and 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 he goes, and Todd's, uh, uh, Chuck smokes pot, so we're going to do it like that. It's better off that he's with us because he smokes pot. <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. So the only time I ever tried out for a band, the only time I didn't get an audition was that time. And you know why? Because the better man won, God rest his soul, the mm. late, great Chuck Val. Yeah, man. Nice. That's amazing, man. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's crazy. And, uh, and that's that. And then I played at, in AF. At Halloween in AF or? That was a while, uh, man. I joined AF in like the su end of the summer of 87 and played with them till the spring of 93. Yeah. At which, point I, at which point I immediately joined Sick of It All. But that lineup with AF with Matt Henderson and Stigma and you was so at good. First, at, first, at first it was Steve Martin on guitar. That's right. 87 and 88 was, was uh, 87, 88, and maybe into 89 a little was, um, was Steve Martin. And then Roger went away. That's right. So vacation. Roger was away for like a year and a half or whatever. So when he came out, we started playing, and Steve Martin had a... a, a had been working on some other stuff. So he was like, no, I'm yeah. not going to play anymore because he went on to be like a professional in the music industry. Yeah. So he did his own thing and uh, we tried out all these guitar players and a million of them and some of them were okay. We almost took this one guy, this guy that played Lefty and uh, but, but Roger was always saying, no, there's this kid in Minnesota. Wait till he comes. He's going to mm. be the guy. And we were like, who's this kid? We tried, We spent weeks trying out everybody. Who's this kid? We didn't. We thought it was bullshit. It's a band he played with out there too. He yeah, came from. Yeah, I don't remember that though. But yeah, like, so he was like, me. he was like, listen, you're gonna like him. And Vinny's like, I don't remember who he is. So he comes in, and we're, I'm, me and Willie are almost like, oh, what the hell are we gonna do? Because Vinny would look at me, me and Willie as guys. You got to tell us if this guy's the right guy. So it was uh. up to me and Willie to really let him know. Yeah. And Willie being a drummer, it's you know, how does he sound with you, Willie? And me being a bass player, it's really important because like, hey. Can he really? Right hands can he up. really play? Like, can this guy really play? Mm -hmm. Like, they ask me, can he play? Yeah, and I'd be like, he's okay, but we tried out Richie Crackdown. Imagine Richie Crackdown and Stigma as the dual guitarist. That would just be crazy. It sounded like I loved the way it sounded, <laughs> but it, you know, it was like throwback to like 1982. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. So, so Maddie came in, and we went to Staten Island to rehearse, and uh, we took the train out, and uh, he was cool, and we played, and we played like two songs right out of the gate. And I was like, Vinny just looked at me and I looked at Vinny and I just nodded my head. I was like, this is the guy. I was like, this guy's great. Damn. And he was cool. I Henderson was, like, was born. So Vinny just looked at me like, oh, he looked at me and was like, okay, kid, 
So I, it was my job to tell him. I go, hey, do you want to play in the band? He's like, yeah. I go, well, you're in. You can't leave, though. You got to really tour with us, and there's no excuses. And it's this thing is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And there's no, hey, I can't do the gig. No, you're doing every gig we book. That's it. No yeah. matter what, this is your 100%. It's like the mafia. Like you're joining in. the army. Yeah, joining yeah. the army. You're in. There's no getting out. And he was like into it. And it's been great. Every yeah, he said he, he, he said he lived in Staten Island for a while. He's kind for of hit no car, nothing, no phone. He just worked on music there for a long time. Yeah, he'd work. I'd go back to Queens and then come into Staten Island. Like I'd come in for like four days and I'd go home for a day or two and come back. And Willie was going back and forth. And uh, yeah, that, that lineup became what it became. And it was, I tell you what, we sounded really good. That was a powerful, yeah, strong was, lineup, dude. man. With with Willie on drums and Maddie on guitar and myself, you know, it like put a really strong backbone. That live and that AF. live and then why nineteen eighty one video is incredible, man. Yeah, the lineup it was, it sounded and, good. One know. voice lineup. Yeah, the way they marched back good. and forth and shit, like That's the way insane, he came, insane. paced up and back, and, and I'm singing, and the big thing of spit comes out. Saw that. <laughs> that Roger was like, "Wait, I had to leave that in." <laughs> Roger has had the bandana and the shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Camo shorts on the rest of the band. So art style. So two questions right there before we move forward. Camo shorts, camouflage. They said they call them the stigmas. Is it true that Vinny Stigmore brought those into the hardcore scene? Uh, I can't say, I think he did. Yeah. I know that that's his thing. He used to wear camo head to toe with boots and the, and the pants tucked into the boots Yeah, with a shaved head and shaved eyebrows. So hard. Yeah. And then and what Frenchie would do that as well. Yeah. And, two of them and then camo. rabies too. Rabies. And one time we were at the Canadian border coming back into America <laughs> and there was this military guy there and he's like, what the hell you boys think you're doing to, to Vinny and, and Frenchie? Vinny and Frenchie just looking around like, what do we do? And the guy's like, you boys are a disgrace to the American military. And they're just like looking around like, they're like, I was in Nam. And the guy's like, you weren't in Vietnam. What, you know, what platoon? And he's like, ah, and like, you know, it was, oh, the guy had him on the spot. We were laughing. It was, you know, it was funny. And so. The rumor has it, the urban legends, that you brought sneakers into the hardcore scene. That's an urban legend. Yeah, you know something? <laughs> I brought the high top into Agnostic Front. That's true. High top white Adidas or Nikes? One of like those. Like white, white Nikes. White on white. Yeah, like white on white, on white, white on black. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the high top, like 80s high top. I brought that to Agnostic Front. They were a pure boot band before Because you could say we're rocking the Jordans and shit like that. I remember that. Yeah, I used to rock always high tops as well. Yeah. Why so, was it? Ankle support or something? Yeah, but I was in New York before they were in New York. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even though they were playing for a long time. Those guys yeah. date back to uh, before I do. Those guys were probably playing shows in 82 and 83 where like Reflex from Pain and all that. Yeah. So Ray and Purcell, they, they're old school Connecticut yeah. guys. No, no doubt there. They turned me on to a lot of good stuff too. A lot of the Boston stuff that I wasn't really into they got me into yeah. so you got to give them their props but you know i was a new york guy yeah you know what I mean? when they moved to new york they were able to call themselves new york hardcore because myself and tommy were in the band and i don't say that true in a way that's uh confrontational yeah i just yeah. say it's like that was their like new york connect in the beginning of Makes them sense. coming to new york you know i always I mean? wonder that too like how you could you know coming from another city but then we did the same thing when you're from there that's interesting because the fucking youth of today they definitely um we're New York Harker, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're Connecticut, but they became a New York man. Wow. So the so yeah. So the sneakers you rock those. I mean, you used to tell you rock those too. Yeah. yeah. Um, were well, you into hip hop at all too? Because New York and hip hop was so connected. A bit. Because you know. weren't just a metal hardcore kid. You liked other shit, right? No, I was into hip hop. I was into rock music. Yeah. I, mean, I was into music. Yeah. To me, it's like I don't really draw all these lines. Everybody was yeah. always, always like, you know, like just this. You're into. I remember like when I was in youth of today, like Ray, uh, Richie and Purcell would be like, "You're into like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and Motorhead," and I was like, "Yeah, it's yeah. good." I go, "It's kind of." corny but it's good music mm -hmm. i was like the music's really good i go there's does, nothing corny i'm like about Iron Maiden. there's nothing corny about motorhead at all but what i'm saying is they sing about like nonsense but i was like yeah it might they might sing about nonsense but it's some of the music's good the first two iron maiden albums are like great they're like punk that's adam's favorite band and that's then what what happened was was, was uh, that's your favorite band oh by far all right and Caref then, careful and then uh, <laughs> and then, careful. And then uh, i remember years after youth of today was done richie being like talking to me about Judas Priest because he was like really into Rob Halford singing and old Judas Priest, mm. like the early stuff. And I was like, wow, you used to hate that. And he's kind of like dancing around like, what do you mean? Uh, I was like, I was like, all right, whatever. I go, you know what you got to check out? The first two Iron Maiden albums. And he's like, no, no, I don't like that. And I was like, dude, come on. You're like Priest now. Check out the first two Maiden albums. There's really, yeah. really good stuff. Yeah. But, uh, you know. Dude, when did Red show up? Uh, 
I got red. Red's his bass, ladies and gentlemen. It's classic bass. It's used on tons of records. Yeah, it's all chopped up. She's got like a hole dug in her. But I got red, and uh, I just found the receipt for it. It was in 83. What'd you pay? $600. Which is pretty That's expensive. A lot for eighty three, and she already had a chip taken out of her. She was dropped. We're talking about a base, she, ladies she and gentlemen. She fell. She fell off the wall, so she fell and had like a chunk taken out of her, and like one scratch already when I got her. And the guy's like, "Yeah, it fell," and I was like, "I'll take this one." She was like an orphan, you know what I mean? She was half beat up. <laughs> so I, I got red. It was six hundred bucks, and it was like I don't remember when. Maybe the fall of eighty three. I got her. It's a well known base, ladies and gentlemen. They're talking about it's a red base. It's got its own sound too. What kind of base was it? It's called a Guitar Man, which is a company that there was a small shop on 48th Street in the, the music area of 48th Street, and there was a guy that made his own guitars and basses. He told me he made uh, 250 approximately guitars in the time he had the shop and probably 80 basses. So that's the amount of stuff he made over the year and a half or whatever he had his his uh, his shop, and those are the ones he made himself. Yeah. You know, so it was a like custom stuff, which is basically it's a P bass with EMGs. With okay. a PJ split, but you know, and that played on many, many records. Yeah, played on a lot of records. Yeah. So um, we did a tour with you guys back then, Agnostic Front, Sick of It All tour. That was like one of the first tours I did. Is really maybe ninety one or something, right? Yeah, <laughs> that was a crazy tour. I, I remember when you came to New York and you were living uh, in Siv's closet. Yes, but didn't I stay at Shake House before that? That's what I was going to ask you, you about. Did. You did. Yeah. Because okay, so back in like eighty nine, I had an apartment with Armand and. John Devil. Devil, yeah. Debussy. John Devil, Debussy. So we had a place in Jackson Heights and we called it Schick House. That was like the nickname of the apartment. So Toby had just come from Maryland. Yeah. And this was like 89 maybe? I came to, I came to, I came to New York in 88, so maybe it, so maybe, yeah. it might be the end of 88. This is probably the end of 88. Okay. So like like maybe maybe after the summer of 88. Yeah. And so Toby, we were like, oh, this kid's a nice kid. So he wound up like sleeping on our couch, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. He slept on our couch for a couple weeks. Yeah. And we were like, all right, cool. He was cool. And then he eventually moved into Siv's closet. Which Siv lived in the same neighborhood as us, maybe Jackson like Heights. you know, like a few blocks away. So he he like moved into Siv's closet. So he lived Alan in Cage's a, bedroom, yeah. Alan Cage's bedroom. There was a clo- like one of those closets uh-huh. where the two doors was it a double door? Uh huh. It was like a double door, like hanging closet. Yeah. And he put like, did you have a? You didn't have a mattress. You had like rolled up something, and they had futon. He or had some yeah. like ninety. I don't think it was food. I think you had rolled up like uh, <laughs> like thick blankets, like comforters. Okay, yeah, yeah. He had a couple comforters, like two comforters on the floor with a pillow and a blanket over him, and he just like closed the closet and go to sleep. I was like, this kid. I was like, this kid's like they, really going for. They it. They used to call me the girly man from Maryland. <laughs> I, like, really? I don't remember that. that. So I don't know if I met you in D.C. before that, before I moved to New York. Cause I moved in with Timmy Chunks originally. You might, but it, you know, when you came to New York and we met, I I, I, can't, I don't remember specifically, but somehow you were in, reintroduced to me as if we had met before. Okay. That's how it. That's how you. Oh, my memory isn't like, oh, this new kid. Yeah, this new kid, but like. Somehow there was a connection there. It may be DC. DC maybe, or maybe yeah. some kind of prior. Oh, maybe you were just because you were friends with Siv. Maybe it was like, yeah, oh, yeah. he's a friend of Siv's. I don't really know. Yeah. So how how long was your AF stint? Like how many years was uh, that? That was eighty seven to ninety three. So six years, a little bit shy of yeah. six years. So that was like going from a boy to a man. Yeah, that's where it was like, hey, we're going on tour. We're going in a van. We're bringing a pit bull. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> Roger would like put me in positions where he'd like go outside and there'd be bikers in like some like southern place and he'd be like that you know he'd go in and tell him he'd go hey this kid right there he just kicked your fucking bike he would Damn. say you know he would do stuff like that just to see what I would do and he'd put me in positions where I had to I had to yeah handle it yeah so it was like well, I was like always like what's this guy putting me in these positions so I was like what's wrong with you and he would just laugh but it taught me to like okay you got to learn how to speak to people. You know, kindly, yeah, but also you, you got to know how to be like, yo, you know, get away from me. You know what I mean? You had to yeah. learn how to kind of stand up for yourself a little bit. So that made me kind of come out of my shell and I became uh, way more. Thicker skin? Thicker skin, knew how to handle myself. The Queen's training I got early in my life resurfaced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The little kid stuff, pre getting high, pre getting drunk, mm-hmm. when I had like a personality and was more outgoing yeah. to a degree. I mean, I was socially kind of shy always, but... It triggered something, no? It triggered me not being so shocked from when I did drugs to cover up my traumatic childhood is what I'm thinking. Got you. You know what I mean? I went into the shell for a few years in my through puberty, I guess. You know so music I mean? was your therapy, pretty music much. Music was absolutely my therapy, therapy 100%. I mean, I, 
I, I didn't grow up with people breaking my balls. I mean, my brothers did. When I moved to New York, I feel like there's this underlying going theme of like, find the weakest spot on a person. It's the weakest spot. Poke at it as much as possible. As much as possible. And fuck with them until they break down in tears. But the minute somebody fucks with you, we're going to rat pack them. Like you guys loved, yeah, yeah, loved yeah. each other unconditionally, but you break their balls. But if somebody else broke your balls, they're going to get fucked yeah, up. What we're talking like. You know what I mean? We're like, talking. It's totally true, but let's be honest. <laughs> you and I have yeah. battled each other for years. Yeah, for <laughs> we sure. kidding. We used to rip like back when you come on tour and was know, like, bro, dude. with the seatbelts. Oh, that's right. You kidding me? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from behind, rip a seat. Like, this guy would behind. grab a seatbelt from behind, choke me from behind. Yeah. Ah, I, feel like, choke I feel like you brought that. I feel like you bought that into the blackout van on the Murphy's Law too. <laughs> I, probably I, feel, I, re I remember See, getting, getting dragged so in the back and beat it, up a couple of times. It's it's like pay it forward type shit. Like you get fucked yeah, with. You yeah. fuck with somebody then I had to fuck with these guys. The dangerous thing about him is if you push them to a certain point though, he... Have a county breakdown. I don't want, I don't want some shit county involved. breakdown. He didn't. He didn't give a fuck. Yeah. He'd rip his shirt off and chase you down. Shit on myself. He'd too. shit in his hand and throw it at you. Smear yeah. it on himself and tackle you. So you had to be careful. If you pushed him to a certain point, Snaps. he would like he would. But he'd be laughing the whole time. But yeah. it was kind of dangerous. So you'd yeah. be like you'd be like yo fuck with him, but no one to back off because he was like a berserker. That's what, that's what they call me on this podcast. Berserker. They got the berserker. dangerous. They got dangerous, you know? <laughs> so I'd be like, yo, don't have to watch out. And Isaac was on that tour. Yeah. And that was bad. Remember remember this time? I'm just give me one second. Yeah. So this whole tour, Isaac's getting into fights every day. And these two guys But, but are he's like, protecting. He's protecting He's people. protecting people. He never starts fights. No, never starts fights. That's true. But he, so he's he like a protector. getting into, so we're in the van and like, we're all like teenagers. So it's like, we're restless. You know what I mean? Restless. Like maybe, maybe I'm in my early twenties at that point. But um, so like you know they'd be bored and these two guys would fight each other. So Isaac would like rip off Toby's shirt and throw one of his <laughs> shoes out the window, and then Toby would be like half crying and half laughing, pissed off. <laughs> so he'd like, you know, he'd like jump on like me or Armand yeah. halfway, and it would get well like one of the roadie, Especially. one of the other guys who was with like Jerry. You jump on yeah. Jerry. Jerry was on that tour. Jersey Jerry. So he'd jump on them, and usually I'm the guy people go for because I'm like the one that jokes around more. Yeah, like, you totally, know, The other yeah. guys are more st straight. Straight men, kind of straight laced, straight <laughs> straight faced is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. So like you know, it turns into this whole thing. So one night we're in a hotel, and we had connecting rooms at the door. I don't know if you even remember this. Let's hear it. But like we're in the middle of this tour. It was like seven weeks long. Too it was long. Jesus. So it's like three in the morning, and bang, 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 bang on a connecting door. And Toby's like, Bud, Bud, our toilet's broke. It's clogged. I need to go to the bathroom, man. You got to let me in. You got to let me in. I'm like, well, I'm asleep. Leave me alone. What are you doing? No, Bud, the toilet's clogged. We can't even pee in it. I can't pee in the sink. I got to go to the bathroom, open the door. Gives me the whole spiel. I'm like, all right, all right, wait a minute. Soon as I click that lock, bam, the door bursts open and Isaac tackles me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Knock over the nightstand, the lamp. 45 minutes later, I'm fighting for my life with this maniac, right? And Toby's just there laughing. Get him, E, get him, E. I'm like, and, I'm, and whoever I'm in the room with, like Armand or somebody's just sitting there watching, like, why are you guys doing this? I want to sleep. And 45 minutes later, I got a bloody lip. My, sh my clothes are half ripped off. I'm scratched up. I'm oh sweating. My God, dude. And he's act like yeah, he forced me to fight him for 45 minutes. Yeah. So finally, he's strong like, too, man. Yeah, he's strong. It's like fighting for your life. It is. So, and <laughs> to, get, to get these guys out of the room, like every time they go yeah. to walk out, he turns around, like smacks me, and I have to tackle them, and then we fight some more. You know what I mean? It was just like the craziest, and everyone, he's laughing. Hey, he's laughing like, like the Joker the whole time. Yeah, he'll laugh. Dude, I got no sleep that night. I was my elbows were all bruised up. I was scratched. My neck was hurt. Got on stage the next day. People thought I got beat up. I kind of did. <laughs> what are you gonna say, Adam? I have nothing. I have nothing to contribute to that. I, you remember back then we had funny no, though. We had no phones, so we would like use the office phones and make long distance phone yeah, calls. Yeah, yeah. And then MAD, we get a phone call. <laughs> yeah. You ran up a bill in Spain because there's no phones back. There's no you, cell phones. You did this. this it is 100 year Deutschmarks. You use the phone. Like I didn't use the phone, Toby. How, and then um, I got another terrible story about you, but go ahead. I got one where we came outside and there were um, those bootleggers in Manchester and they were bootlegging the scratch oh, the surface yeah, shirts. Yeah. So me, Rusty, Eric Rice, and Craig went out to the back. Somebody, I had mayonnaise. Somebody had a Pete, pipe. Pete too was Pete, involved in that. Yeah, we came out there and just kind of like. But leading up to that, they would come to the shows all throughout Europe. The, they called themselves the Manchester Mafia. It was like some bootleggers in Manchester that I guess like some some like organized crime type guys in Manchester yeah. would send these kids out. They had a printer. No joke. So they'd print shirts and they'd send these kids out. So what would happen is Mark is this big German guy, Mark M.A.D. So Mark would go up to them, throw them on the ground and like, oh, no, no, speak German. And one of us would come up and be like, hey, hey, this guy's going to kill you. 
you got to take it easy. Yeah, right? yeah. good cop, bad cop. You take style. the guy, you take the guy's ID out of his wallet. You go, hey, yeah. so and so, you should chill. Hey, this guy's gonna kill you. We'd play that role, and the guy would be like, okay, I'd be like, you can go, you can go, but don't come back. Tell your friends not to come back. This guy's yeah. gonna kill you. You play good cop, bad cop. And then when the guy gets twenty feet away, you throw his, his stuff at him. He goes, "Fuck you! I'll see you in Manchester." Remember they kept saying that. Yeah, man. So when we were in Manchester, one of them sent a message to us right after we got off stage. Says, why, don't, like, why don't you do something now? You're in Manchester. Yeah, we all came outside. So we all like, came out. You had a jar of mayonnaise. Yeah, you had a pipe. Maybe I had this long skinny pipe. Somebody got hit. I think you hit Smokey with the pipe too. Then the yeah, 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 yeah. I hit Smokey with the pipe. <laughs> So, so we come outside, we kick open the doors, like, where are they? There's, like, there's like six of us, and there's like 30 of them. Dude. But we come out, and I think what happened was Eric goes, he goes, let me see that shirt. We came out calm, like with the stuff behind our backs. Eric goes, let me see that shirt. And the guy it was on stairs Smokey. at Manchester University. Smokey goes, let me see that shirt. And he looks at it, he goes, hmm. And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, it's like 10 quid. And Smokey just lays the dude out. And I think Toby was like, oh, shit. And he throws the jar of mayonnaise in somebody's face. Yep. Then you like hit a guy from like four feet away in the face. <laughs> and the guy, <laughs> boom, jar breaks, the mayonnaise is everywhere. <laughs> So, and you, it was a pipe swing. Yeah so, yeah, so this fight's happening, but I have this six foot pipe behind my back and I'm kind of like stuck. I'm like, what do I do with this pipe? So all of a sudden the fight breaks out and I'm like, oh shit. I look down the steps and there's a guy running up to me dressed in all black with a black ski mask and a baseball bat. Oh shit, that's right. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh shit. And I froze for a second and I thought to myself, go, I'm the one that has to do it. I'm the one with the big artillery. So I pulled this giant six foot pipe out that was pretty thin. You know, it was like as thick as a stickball bat. It was like a long, skinny pipe. I just grabbed it as we were coming out. And the dude's coming up the steps with the bat, like swinging the bat, trying to get close to me. So I'm wailing this pipe with two hands over his head, and he's blocking it with the bat. Like That's I right. have him at bay, and he's holding his, the bat over his hand, head, and I'm, he's blocking the bat and swinging at my legs, and I'm jumping back and hitting him on the thing, hit on the pipe. So what happens is, after about four or five swings back and forth, I hit the guy's hand with the pipe and he drops the bat and he yells something out and the bat goes down and he like runs down the stairs like and he's like holding his hand like, ah, yeah, like yeah. jumping up and down so by the time i finished fighting with that guy and he runs away all of these dudes had run out into the street because we came out like a bum rush we did and shocked them real bad we like hurt like five or six of them enough where they all ran back into the street to regroup yeah so i'm standing there after this guy runs away and i look at him run away with the bat and i have the pipe and all of a sudden nobody's around me i'm by myself and and like a group of dudes that were on the side of the stairs i guess those guys those okay. manchester guys like they scattered into the street and on the side of the stairs they all came running up to me as i had the pipe so they got a semicircle around me and i was swinging the pipe trying to keep them off and they're like trying to get me and i'm up against the doors of manchester university at the top of the stairs so all of a sudden i'm trying to get these guys i'm batting them off i'm hitting them a little bit a dude breaks through the semicircle and runs at me. So I'm like, try to wail him with the pipe as hard as I can to keep him off me. And as he goes to tackle me, I hit him in the bicep with it, like a check swing in the bicep. So, and he grabs, he goes, oh, and he grabs me and it's smoky. I didn't realize it was smoky. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, get inside, get inside. You're, you're surrounded. So I drop the pipe. We break through the two or three guys that are like to the side of us and we run full speed to jump through the doors. That's right. So, so Toby goes through the door. I mean, excuse me. Eric goes through the doors. Smokey goes through the doors. And whoever was there puts like, you know how when you shut like school doors, they have the big two by four that goes yeah, in the top slots. Latches it, yeah. It latches. They had one. At sh like The guy puts it at shin level as I'm running full speed. So I run. So if, so nobody else can get in. They, yeah, like, they yeah, just, yeah. Even though the door was open to get us in, they braced it right after Smokey went through. I saw it go down, but I didn't realize what was happening. I was in such like a panic. And I run full speed, hit my shin on this two by four, go flying in the air land on the ground my shins like bleeding and exploded i look up and dick dale is standing over me because he played the big room upstairs <laughs> dick dale standing over me and he, he looks at me and he puts his hand out and he goes he goes i'll play with you anytime you're a fine bunch of young men and he picks me up <laughs> and he like pats me on the back he saw the whole fight so he was like you know he was like, that's amazing he, saw those, so he was like, like you know like you boys are, you know you boys are bad <laughs> and that was it and then we were all and, and then then we went in the, remember we went in the backstage and the dude with the mask was trying to break the window of the bus with the beer kegs. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, the kegs. Yeah, they wrote, they wrote Manchester Mafia. That was that something. little dude. They wrote Manchester Mafia on the bus, and the dude was trying to throw the keg through the window, but he was so short that he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't throw it up. So we all ran outside the back door with like pipes and stuff like that and chased them, and they ran away. And then Yeti, TS, mm -hmm. TS lives out here now. TS had like this rubber PVC pipe. 
So this couple was there, and he wound up beating the guy in front of his girlfriend with the PVC pipe because he thought it was one of those guys. No He like way. Beat, hit the guy in the arm, the side. The guy fell down. And the girl's like, no, no. So then he backed off, and he was like, oh, shit. And we're like, run to the bus. So oh, we all shit. left. He wound up beating the guy. The guy wasn't hurt. He probably bruised up, though. And that was the story. And I think the next day we heard they were coming, so we had like Bob Wire, and we built we built like a <laughs> stupid. We built like a runway from the bus to the venue, and Mark Amity set up like a fort. So if they came, we had sticks, and like we had it ready for the if next day. If you only played a couple hours away, two yeah. hours away or something, but nobody came. It was like chicken wire and shit, so you didn't get into the venue and shit. Yeah, like. It was really stupid. <laughs> so uh, for, for the first, like probably the first 10 years of our career, every single interview we did, someone would ask about Toby being a sick of it old roadie. Yeah. Now I am going to ask about Toby being a sick of it old roadie. <laughs> how uh, how was Toby Morse as a road crew member? Uh, if you want to be technical, as far as being a roadie to to do the job yeah, of a roadie, okay, let's start with that. He was the worst roadie <laughs> that that I've ever seen in my entire life. Thanks, playing man. music. This guy would lose every day. He'd lose something sure, different. Did. Didn't even know. He didn't even have like a count of what was what. He would lose cymbals, kick yeah, drums. This guy lost everything every single day. But I was fun to hang out with. He was real fun to that's hang out important with. Important to it. We had a blast. We had a we had a blast. He was fun to hang out with. We would joke around. The whole powder thing in the back of the van oh, was yeah. just classic. <laughs> I'd be like, no, no, don't use that much powder. You're going to get a rash. I got this rash, bud. And I put baby powder I'd be like, no, you got to stop it. He'd throw like more baby powder. I'd be like, you got a rash because you're using too much of it. It was just great. <laughs> it was just great. And then shitting everywhere. Um, oh, he used to do crazy things when he was ropes. young. Yeah. yeah. He talked about it. Crazy stories. He'd do, he'd do crazy shit to make us all laugh and we'd laugh. I think that's more important. That's when you're a kid though. You know what I mean? Like you need like the fun dude. He was like the, he was like the comic relief. I was like yeah. the jester. He was the jester. But yeah, but it was fun though. It was yeah. like, it was all like loving, lighthearted. Yeah. It was not, nothing like, nothing. We weren't like treating him like dirt or anything. No, he was no, our no. friend. I mean, we, yeah. we would be hard with each other, but it was, it was like j- hard with the joking. New York ball breaking shit. Yeah, it was fun. We had fun. We had a blast. That, I remember like, Armand would be like, you've left a snare drum. How are we supposed to play that? Oh, but I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could definitely get Lou out of the crowd. I could definitely undo the chords if it got tangled. Yeah, he could He could do like the... I could Sometimes I braid Lou's um, rat tail for him. He could do like when there was a problem, like the cord got yeah. mangled. Lou was like twisting his leg. He and put the, out the fire. Yeah, yeah. he put out the fire. He was good at putting out the I fire. I love stage diving during their set. But I'll tell you... <laughs> walking on heads. I'll tell you what happened though. This is one thing he did that was bad. So we played the limelight, <laughs> right? Back in 95, we played like the limelight. And uh, it was right great. Right yes, yeah. It sold out show. Yeah. I think H2O, that was one of your first shows, right? I don't know you if we played that one. Was that was Rancid? No. No, that was us headlining no, was with before Snapcase. Before we did before one H2O. with Snapcase. Uh, yeah. Okay. You were roadieing that one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we played, right? Sold out the limelight in New York. You know what I mean? Sold out to the rafters. We came out and killed it. It was like one of those high energy show. shows. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the show, I'm with my mother was at the show. My mother's like, My goodness, you've gotten so good. You're so energetic. Blah blah blah. I'm like, oh yeah, mom. Come on. I'm sweating, hyperventilating. I go to take my mom backstage. She doesn't have a pass. Oh shit. So the bouncer's like, You can't bring her upstage. I go, I just sold out your club. You saw me up there. I goes, my mother. My mother has to come backstage. I don't know what happened to her pass. I go, Mom, what happened to your pass? She goes, I didn't get one. I'm like, what? Turns out that my friend right here, Toby, <laughs> took all the passes and passed them out to like everybody. You know, uh, all like the... The fellas. All yeah. the fellas. He passed it out to all the fellas. So my mom didn't get one. So <laughs> I'm so sorry. So, 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 I, so I was young. I was young. And my mom likes you too. Yeah, you know your what mom's mean? awesome. I'm sorry about that. That's what you say. I'm sorry about my mom. That's what you say about my mom. Don't we'll be starting that shit again. We're older men. We don't do that anymore. All right, buddy? Your mom's <laughs> yeah, watch awesome. it. Yeah. Any, anyway, so so I'm like, I have my pass. And I say to the guy, I go, what are you kidding me? I'm cursing at the guy. I go, calm down. He goes, go up to the office and talk to him. So I go up to the office and instead of thinking to myself, exp- instead of calming down and saying, hey, I, we had an issue with the passes, my mother's passes. And yeah, he snapped. I knocked on the door. The limelight was a mob run club. So I knock, I'm pounding on the door, pounding on the door, the door's locked, get the fuck out here. So some guy comes out and he's like, what are you doing? And I go, my mother didn't get a pass. I sold out your fucking club. My mother can't come back here. You know, she can't stay out there. She can't breathe well, blah, 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 this whole thing, right? So the guy's like, what, what? And he looks, there's a guy sitting there counting stacks of money in a suit. So he looks back at the guy and the guy nods his head. So the guy stands up, pulls out like a, a pistol, and starts walking toward the door. And I see that. And I'm looking at the guy with the gun walking out to the door. <laughs> and the guy that's at the door, like the the, the, the club guy, jumps on me. So it's what? We're, we're at a fight. So we're in the hallway. You're by yourself? I was by myself. So we're in the hallway. And the guy like 
jumps out and grabs me by my shirt and like shove it's in a hallway. Like so the guy yeah. shoves me against the wall of the hallway, right? And we struggle for a second and I kind of push him off me and he's at the end of the hall standing there and he's like all mad, like ready to so he charges at me and I was in a southpaw position, right? Which means a left <laughs> which means a left hand lead, right foot back. So the guy goes to charge at me and I snap a southpaw jab and I catch him like in the forehead between the eyes, not super hard, but just quick. Bap! I catch him with a jab and the guy goes boom and his head hits the wall and his eyes open real wide and he looks at me like shocked and he uh it wasn't a hard shot but it, he didn't you know stunned him like a little, little wake up call it was like yeah. as soon as that shit popped off he was about to make his move and i was like pop i caught him and yeah caught him with a shot and he was like wake up call and so he dove through the door so he dove through the door and was shutting the door on me as i'm trying to push the door open to fight the guy because i'm all stupidly <sighs> i'm stupidly excited i didn't keep my wits yeah and the guy with the gun is behind him shutting the door with the gun hand, I you know like yeah. you could see the gun. He's shutting the door, so Jesus. I'm trying to I'm going motherfucker by screaming, going crazy, trying to open the door. And as I'm trying to open the door, I'm hitting the door and hitting the guy in the head, trying to get him. And I wind up hitting the door in that rage and breaking my entire hand. You see, Alex, you broke your hand at the limelight show. Yeah, in three places. Oh, because they gave the passes away. Yeah. Fuck, Craig, I even knew that story. Shattered that whole shattered that whole bone. You could see it's like completely yeah. Down. You you remember that story because oh then we did God. three days later we went to Europe and That's that right. was the European. Remember I had the cast. Yeah, I do. So played in a cast. Dude. Three days later we went on a European tour and I played the entire tour with my hand. The doctor goes, we got to put a cast because my hand, my 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 fourth metacarpal was like shattered. He Jesus goes, Christ! We got to we got to give you an L cast like all the way up to your bicep. I go, no, you're gonna give me one of those little slip on casts with a with a, a wrap. And the guy's like, it won't heal right. I go, it's the only choice. I go, it's that or nothing. So the guy did it and he goes, look. You know, you can't hit it. You can't move it. I go, I'm going to play bass for like 37 shows. What are you talking about? <laughs> the guy's like, that's crazy. It's not going to heal right. I go, it will. So what I would do is I would just turn the amp up real loud and I put crazy glue on one finger and put the pick on there so it wouldn't fall out. So I could play really soft. And I just had to like really just nub it. So but did yeah. you go to the hospital that day? Like ambulance come? You just walked out like holding your hand? That was I it. walked out holding my hand. And the next morning I woke up and it was like, like a look like a softball, so I went to like a first med spot, and they were like, "Oh, your hand is shattered." Like, "Oh, your hand." Your mom shattered. must have been very worried. Yeah, they're like your hand is shattered. Did your mom even know what happened? Why? Why that happened? The whole story? No, what happened was then I went to the backstage, and I came in the backstage like, "Oh, my hand, my hand!" And Pete's like, "What are you talking about?" I go, "My hand's broken." I showed it because holy shit. So then I go, "The bouncers are coming to get me because the bouncers were all called to come and get me." So Pete's father, who's a big guy he's a big dude stood up and was like when they tried to come in the door he's like nope nope nobody in here he goes he goes nobody's doing anything and everybody oh. in, everybody in my band and the pete's father and his brothers were all ready to fight these bouncers but they were smart enough to be like hey hey let, let's talk let's work it pete's out his brother's no joke too yeah, yeah yeah so so then i said i just said my case i go my mother's downstairs she has no pass i go i sold out your club i yelled at the guy in the room and we had a like a, a scuffle i go i shouldn't have done that i should have been calm but my mother is downstairs and she has a medical condition and she can't stand down there for that long. Yeah. And the guy's like, okay, okay. Doug, we'll get your mother a pass. Let's just forget the whole thing. I was Damn. like, okay. I was like, okay, cool. And the guy came over, he shook my left hand, so my right hand was shattered. <laughs> and that was that. Holy fuck, I didn't even knew this shit like because of the passes. That and was shit. your fault. So then you went to Europe right after with the HO Civ Sick of all. I think and I played was... the whole tour with a broken hand. Fuck, and that was when that man. fight happened the first day. Remember that fight? Okay. Put money in the meter? Yeah. Okay, cool. Remember that fight um, happened the first day? What was the first day? Remember, we played with a couple, another friend of ours, band, and then. And oh, your yeah. drummer had yeah. that situation. I talked about it with Henderson on the podcast. Yeah, it was a one on one thing. That was really weird. That was that. That was uncomfortable, but it had to be, it had to happen. It was a one on one thing. It you know? sucked. Yeah. You know, Maddie wanted it for whatever, yeah. for his own reasons. Yeah. So, you know, you got to let it happen. It was a personal thing that had nothing to do with my band. I remember dude. Max was like coming to me, and I'm, I have a broken hand, and I'm sitting there with Arthur trying to figure out how to actually play a full show. I'm like, oh, Arthur, how am I going to do this? And he's like, try holding the pick like that. He's like, you yeah. know, me and Arthur were working out how Arthur and I were, how I was going to play. Yeah. And Max comes up to me all scared, like, what do I do? What do I do? I go, you go over there, and you say, let's do this now, and don't get within arm's reach when you say it. <sighs> So what he's, talk, what he's talking about, people, is Matt Henderson had, had a beef with the, my original drummer. And what happened was the word on the street was when they saw each other at a European festival, they're going to fight a, a fair one behind the buses or the vans after the show. So it is what it is. It had to happen. It was before. had nothing to do with my band. had nothing to do with any of the bands. It was something with a girl. It was personal between them. Yeah, the so when they them. saw each other, 
we had to go and there was this one-on-one fight in the dirt in the field like by a festival it was totally and all of us are staying in a circle around it and it was just a one-on-one thing and I'm standing done. there with a broken hand trying to play the bass watching like oh let's see what happens it was, here uh, that, why are we talking about fighting this yeah, is so was, dumb so silly. this is really stupid that fight so sick of it all man that, 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 this has been an incredible run for you because you've been in the band since what year was that now uh, 93, the beginning of 93. It's crazy. And here we are. Why did we talk about fighting? That's I just came, It just came out. You mentioned it. You mentioned the thing. Came I, out. Why? I don't know. It's, just, it's, it's part of the story. It was, like a um, four, it was like 40 minutes of bullshit. Yeah. So listen, so um, 2019. Yeah, man. So now here we are now and you're still playing a sick of all, which has been an incredible journey, man. It's insane. Yeah. You know, I never thought it would last us. Like, I never really thought about it. I just wanted to play. Yeah. And then next thing you know, it's all over the place and you're constantly touring and everything and it's it seems to not go away, which is great. Yeah. It's like we have this like blessed situation where we can continue to play as we're older men and people still appreciate it. Yeah. It's almost like we did something and didn't realize the impact it would have. You did, you, you've, been, you've been involved in a lot of bands that had impact on my life. You've been in a lot of music, Thank early you. music and all that stuff. The thing about it is when did you realize like this is my career and I'm doing this full time? It's hard to say. It just became this thing that I did. I, I'm guessing that when I joined Sick of It All, I, I knew it was going to really stay. Yeah. I, it was always my thing, but I was looking like, well, what am I going to do when I'm old? But Were you then, always worried about a plan B? I didn't worry about a plan B, but I had it in the back of my head. Yeah. So at one point, I wanted to uh, 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 do something else, try to like become a chef. But I, I didn't. You've always been a good cook, yeah. I like to cook, but I, that, no, that, that, that didn't go anywhere. That was like- Culinary school. Yeah, it never happened. I never okay. happened. I joined Sick of It All instead. Yeah, did you ever but, feel like quitting ever playing music? Well, when, when I first joined Sick of It All, when I did that first tour with them right after the last AF tour before they broke up yeah. at that point in 93, I told Sick of It All, I said, listen, I'll do this tour with you guys, but I think I'm going to go to school to become a chef and we'll see what happens. I probably won't stay in the band. But that didn't happen at all. Yeah, uh, as, soon as, I, as soon as I did that tour, you remember that tour? Yeah, man. I was, I was like, no, nah, I'm doing this. Forget about that other stuff. Yeah. I didn't really care about that. You know what I mean? It's crazy because you do it because you love it. There's no retirement plan. There's no 401k. There's none of that. There's a lot of sacrifice involved. It's not as easy and as fun and glamorous as people think. Not at all. So much sacrifice. You miss people's weddings, their funerals, people's uh, everything. You're living in a car six months out of the year Mm -hmm. for your entire life. Yeah. People don't understand that at all. And you're and you're like eating garbage in the early days. You're in a van. You're living in a car. You're not eating. You're not showering a lot. You know, and you're and you're struggling really, really hard just to get up for an hour every night and play. Back then, it was like forty minutes. Forty that's, minutes. That's all you're doing. You're getting. You're putting every everything is that. You have those twenty three hours of like trying to sleep, eat, get to the show on time, all that. It's that. That's that's what it is. Yeah. People think like, oh man, you're in a band. It must be awesome. I'm like, it's work. It's a lot. People people have said to me, well, you work an hour a night. What are you talking about? I'm like. I, I work all, I'm living in a car. Yeah. I'm basically living yeah. in a van. You know yeah. what I mean? It, it's not really. Is it hard to explain to like adult people in the real world, like what your band's called and what you guys kind of music you play? They don't really get it. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. But I tell them like I play in a band and yeah. like, oh, that must be cool. But then if they like understand what it is, they're like, that's, they think it's like associated with some something weird. Maybe mm-hmm. they don't understand. And I always try to tell them, this is what I say to just regular people I have no idea I go I play in like a hardcore punk band I go but it's not kill your mother rape your father yeah yeah it's 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 songs that are positive they're, they're about it's not like, fuck your parents and all that yeah, shit it's about trying to strive to, to, to it's you know sing songs about social injustice and yeah. striving to better yourself yeah and they're like oh that's cool and then they hear it they go it sounds negative I'm like well don't you feel like that's the difference between punk and hardcore? I feel like punk was like anarchy in UK, fuck your parents, fuck the government. I actually love my mom. And then, yeah, the har- me and then, too. And then hardcore. Yeah, I love your mom too. Yeah, then- <laughs> she's great. <laughs> and then hardcore was like, let's fix the world. Let's make it a better place. Let's talk about veganism and Krishna and straight edge and changing the world and the government. And, you know, like it was all like fixed things. Talking not- about problems yeah, not- as opposed to. Com- well, you're complaining about it. You know, yeah, exactly. You know talking I mean? about like, solutions instead of complaining about it. Yes. Yeah, we're talking about how punk yes. rock was like, fuck everything. And Harko's comment was like, let's kind of fix it, fix everything yeah, too, like in a the, sense. Yeah, punk rock's destroy Harko's build. Yeah, exactly. That's what I loved about it. I think about this like, um, I think about like the stuff I've done with all this. And it's like, when I look at it from a third party perspective as a grown man, it's a really good thing. Yeah. We're like singing songs. Like to me, it's just every day. It's what I do. I write the song, then we record it. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't strike me the way it does somebody who buys the record and is a fan. Hundred percent. It strikes me as like the whole process. I see it. It just feels like whatever. It's like my life or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But to a guy that I don't know that comes to the shows, he buys the record, he reads the lyrics, and listens to the song, and maybe he gets off drugs from that, or it helps 100%. him with a problem. You know how many people have come up to you and said, "Oh, you yeah. help me with this." 
that's a good thing. Dude, the stuff, this stuff we do is, is serious. We make the world a little bit better. A I think. little bit. Yeah. I mean, not to be gassy, but it's no, true. We're trying. No, we're it's trying. True, we're doing our best. You it's know? A, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing that we do and we enjoy doing it. So yes. it's like, it's, it's not like uh you know, we're not like a, a corporation that's like raping the rainforest. You know, we're like, no. we're, we're doing something good. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're, we're taking a gift that was given to us by the artists and the, the people that inspired us and we're paying it forward. Hopefully. Exactly. It, it, to the uh, new generation exactly it's like it's it's a it's a little closer to freedom than the average person has yes the freedom to do your own thing we have no bosses we're our own boss no bosses we're not like putting that workforce competitive treat people like crap thing we're able to like really kind stuck of stuck in a rut all we, that got, we got one foot in freedom which is really yeah. nice and, and if you we, we create things that people actually yes. and we sing like. songs about topics that touch people yeah because when i write lyrics i'm writing stuff that means something to me and then other people associate with that and it's a good thing you know you know the deal yeah 100 you know? percent. i feel like that's that, that's the key to longevity too is, is you continue to inspire people in different generations of people and people that's still right. come to your shows and care about you absolutely and they grew up with you and we're lucky to have it because none of us had hits on the radio or sold a lot of records Cause, cause, because right now there's a there's a craig ahead growing up in a town with an abusive alcoholic father you know what I mean? True, maybe, man. maybe, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Exactly. Like, like a you somewhere else listening yeah, yeah, yeah. to your records, the way you listen to those records, or doing something complete, or doing something completely different in a different, completely different sphere, 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 sphere. sphere. I hate that. It's a weird word. It's in a, a hard one. In to a say. completely different, like, like sphere, and um, he's gonna <laughs> ma- he's gonna make uh, an impact to the people that he aligns with. Yeah, that 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 are that that are on the same wavelength as him. It's a good thing. We're all very blessed. Yeah. What do you, what do you think the key was for sick of it all is longevity? Uh, it's like 35 years right determination. now. Determination. Termination. Here's the deal. Commitment. Yeah. We will, we will get in the van and go. We will play. We will do this. We will, do, we will just do it. It's like the guy that'll keep doing push ups forever and he wins the bodybuilding contest. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Don't stop. There's a pizza. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. You don't turn it down. Like, it's really easy to be like, oh, I don't want to do that. I have to do this. I'm going to stay home this weekend instead of, because I need to take care of this. That's how everybody's wired. And that's how we're, even I'm wired. Yeah. But I have this thing in me that looks like, it's a show. It's what you do. Go play it. Go, go, go. And that's the difference. That's what makes you stick around and get to the, I don't want to say top of the food chain because that sounds arrogant, but you get to be uh, uh a staple persistence in, too, commitment, yeah, all that. The, we, we got, we got to be staples mm-hmm. in our, in our music because we went the extra mile and we never yeah. turned stuff down. We, that's not to say I won't turn down a, a terrible show offer, Yeah, but I'm saying when you're committed, you're committed and you go. Yeah. We had Don't to turn down lazy. a really good offer today just to continue to play the other shows we had booked. But, um, we're going to say about sick roll. I was going to say something else too about, Oh yeah. And I'm not even blowing smoke and being honest. I mean, Adam talk about it all the time. You guys could be playing in front of a hundred people, 300 people, 20,000 people, you always give it 110%. Try, try our best. I've never, I've seen, never seen you guys play a bad show. I've never seen you go through go, go through the motions and be like, even if the crowd was whack, you still continue to give it yeah, all. But I you love guys, that. You guys do the same thing because, you know, we we work, we we help each other. Yeah. There's, there's you know, we're, we're like But a, sometimes it's hard. Like there's when a you're, symbiotic relationship between the bands from our genre. But sometimes the connection is not there. Sometimes it's hard to lose yeah. the energy, but you guys always bring it, man. Like, it's, well, from your perspective, watching you think that, but sometimes I'm up there dying like, Oh man, yeah, this yeah, crowd's sure. dead. But yeah, yeah, but we, but we, I don't feel that. And the crowd doesn't feel that. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? like, That's why being a bass player is a little bit easier on the shot shows. Cause <laughs> it's a little, a little harder on the joints though. It hurts. Bass player yeah. hurts. They, this is why some people use two straps instead of one. Yeah, talk about it. You created the double strap, <laughs> right? That was ba- a good segue. <laughs> the back buddy. Now I invented that in the '90s, and uh, because I, I had a I have a blown disc in my lower back, so I started getting numbness on my whole left side, and and it was from the weight of the bass. I started getting numbness in my ear, and my face, and my hands, and my feet. Yeah. And uh, I was like, man, this you know it happens after I play a show. It felt felt really weird. My eye would get lazy and stuff. So I took two straps. I configured them. I did a whole bunch of like measurements and f- got these straps and I kind of built them up and I put them together in a certain way and I connected it and I did a whole bunch of prototypes till I found the one that works. So now I make them myself by hand. I sew them up with, with uh, dental floss, heavy duty dental floss and I make them myself and um, I caught them, you know, I caught some of them, you know, I caught them a certain way. That's and I, amazing. And I make it and it, it solved my back issue. You can't move as freely. You're a little stiffer up top. 
you can't get that upper body movement the same, but the, because it's more held in a spot. But I, I invented that in the nineties. And then some guy, and I, I think I remember who he was. I think he was at a show in New York. He was like some engineer guy. He was like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Let me look at that. And he's like talking to his friend, like, see how it's set up back here. And then this guy patented it. Wow. And, no he, he, actually, way. and he actually was dealing with Diodario, who I was in Dorsey of, but I didn't make a big deal out of it because he patented it and I didn't. So, wow. didn't but I felt like, you know, I'm a hardcore guy and I got robbed. Like I didn't do it myself. Yeah. It, it would have cost me like a, a, a fair amount of money to, to patent it. And I thought, well, you know, who's going to really want this? Besides, yeah. Besides deep bass players that tore a lot. So it's not like a big money thing, but the guy, uh, the guy patented it and he holds the patent, not me, but it, it never went anywhere. Yeah. I saw it being sold by Diodario for a while. I don't even think they carry it anymore. Yeah. Wow. I haven't seen anybody ever using it live. I've seen, I've seen approximately one bass player using the two <laughs> straps. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and that's you. My mind's a little different than his. I won't say how, but yeah, you know, so I, I could conceivably make them and sell them at this point. Yeah. But, but here's the thing though. Isn't it, it's all that work for what? Yeah. Who's going to buy it? Maybe you'll buy one. But actually, I, <laughs> but here's the deal. I'd give you one because you're yeah, my friend. Yeah. So who would want one? Would Randy want one? Yeah. I mean, Randy's not paying for one. I'm giving him probably one. Probably will take one if you give him away. I, yeah, but I, who am I, I'm not going to charge you for it. You're my friend. I, if I had to buy the parts, I'd be like, oh, the parts yeah. are like, you know, however many bucks. Yeah. There, there is, the, a, there is parts. one topic that, unless when I was putting money in the meter, I missed it. Boxing. Yeah. yeah, okay. Like when did like when did you get into the the sweet science? Probably when I was like around 17. So uh my my childhood best friend in my neighborhood, Sean Graham. His uncle was Billy Graham, Irish Billy Graham, the welterweight who was a welterweight. Oh, wow. He's known as the uncrowned champ. He was a welterweight in the 50s, beat Sugar Ray Robinson in the amateurs. Wow, uh, damn. Beat Carmen Basilio as a pro before Carmen Basilio beat Sugar Ray Robinson for the middleweight title at welterweight he beat him. And then um, he he uh, he fought all of the best welterweights in the fifties. He uh, he fought Kid Gavilan five times, once for the title, and beat him. But he lost the decision, and that's why they call him the Uncrowned Champ because Kid Gavilan was with the Mafia with Blinky Palermo and those guys, oh, and he shit. wasn't. He was Irish, so he would always say "f you" to the mob, and they didn't control him, so he didn't win the title. He had a hundred and he had a hundred and twenty six fights was never knocked down and had, I think, I believe it was a hundred and he had a hundred and 12 wins or something like that. Damn. He was like the best. He was the best welterweight, technically the best skilled boxer of that era as at a welterweight. At welterweight. He was, he beat all the top guys. Irish Billy Graham. Irish Billy Graham. Look him up. Master, master boxer. And, his brother was Jack Graham, who was my friend Sean Graham's father. So Jack Graham was the deputy commissioner, the deputy commissioner of the New York State Athletic Commission. So I would smoke pot in Sean's basement. We'd drink beer and be stupid. And, every, <laughs> and Sean sometimes would be like, "No, I'm not hanging out tomorrow night. I got to do something." And I'd be like, "What are you doing? Why? Why don't you want to get high?" And he'd be like, "No, I got to do something." And he'd be quiet. So Fight one day, club. one it's day good. I was like, "What do you do?" He goes, "Well, I go with my father to work." I'm like, "What is it?" He goes, "Boxing." I go, "Yeah." I go, I'll go with you next Thursday because we'd go to the, the Felt Forum every other Thursday. He would go. So I went with him and uh, I had just started taking martial arts. JKD, you know, Jeet Kune Do. Mm -hmm. So I'd been doing that for a few months and I was learning like rudimentary boxing and some kicks and some like some rudimentary stuff. That was like Bruce Lee's thing. So I learned some mm -hmm. rudimentary martial arts and the, the instructor there would always be like, he'd be like, you're really good with your hands. You punch well and you have a good sense of... of how to use your hands and how to move. He goes, you practice that at home a lot? I go, not really, just when I'm here. He goes, well, that seems to be the thing you're taking to here more than the kicking and everything else. So then I went to the fights with Sean and his father Jack at the Felt Forum front, you know, front row, yeah. and I watched the fights, and I was like, I want to do this. Because I was never a tough kid. I was like a shy, quiet kid. Yeah, I was, I was never an that. alpha male. I was like ultra, yeah, ultra quiet. If anyone, if anything, I was the guy that got picked on. You know yeah. what I mean? Because I was like real nice and real quiet. Yeah. And uh, so Jack Graham, rest his soul, got me a trainer in Queens, like a good boxing trainer and all that. And uh, I just got into, and I thought to myself, why pay this martial arts guy money when I can go to the PAL in my neighborhood for $3 a year? You know, so I went there and I started boxing and then uh, I had some trainers and I, I, you know, I just developed, 
I worked on it every like the way I played bass when I first started playing bass. That's how I treated boxing. Gotcha. It was my own private thing. I didn't have time to really compete because I was on tour all the time. Yeah. But when I wasn't on tour, even when I was on tour, I would shadow box all day before the show. All yeah, day. I've seen you doing that. Backstage. I would do yeah. that constantly, working on stuff. I go to a gym in Germany and hit the bags and work on stuff. I'd work with some pros. They'd show me some stuff. You know what I mean? I was constantly in the gym. When I was home, I was training, 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 running, always training, sparring, running, learning, learning. So uh, then eventually, like later on, uh, I trained in Rhode Island for a little while. I was living there for a while. I, I actually worked a corner at Vinny Pazienza's gym for his flight, fight with Floyd Hunnigan in the gym. That's uh, awesome. And, uh, and uh, I worked a sparring partner's corner. And I sparred with a couple of Golden Glove champs over there. And then I came back, and there was a guy in my neighborhood named Eddie O'Boyle who was a pro. He fought under Don, Don Turner, was his coach, who trained Holyfield later in his career. And uh, he took me under his wing and took me to the next level and got me to be where I was respected in the gyms of New York in boxing. That's awesome. I would spar with all these kids getting ready for the gloves, hold my own very well. I was able to box with, with high-level amateurs and pros, and I was competitive with them. So uh, he's the guy that showed me that, yeah, you have skill and an understanding and you have scientific knowledge of the sport, but you have to know how to apply it when the going gets rough. So he's the guy that taught me. He's the guy that showed me that I'm a tough guy. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. I didn't know it, but I always was. My kindness is my toughness. My decency is my toughness. Yeah. That determination that I made me get in the van every day is the same determination I show in the ring. Yeah. That's Plus, awesome. I was gifted with a concrete chin, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> but, and that's a sport that I love. So anyone that thinks that's about violence, they're wrong. That's a yeah. sport about discipline and determination. Yeah. This, you know what sucks about this this episode we're doing now? People are going to think I'm like this, like, different than I am. Like, I'm You're not. not. Your penis is awesome. I'm not a tough guy at all. I have a I'm question, too. I'm a nice guy. I, like now, like, you're I, just talking about all this like. This is stuff. stuff you're into. Yeah, now you're reaching, That's what I'm into, yeah. You're reaching 50 soon. Do you feel different pains getting off stage after oh, playing yeah. shows? I've had multiple knee surgeries. I've yeah. had uh, blown discs in my back, tore my, my ankle out. I've all from my, hardcore. All from hardcore. Problems with my hands. Uh, uh, pinched, uh, blown, uh, swell, swollen discs in my neck. I have, a, I've had multiple knee surgeries. Uh, I've has, got, it, has the hearing? Hearing's pretty That's bad. That's a good question. Back in 1996, I got my hearing checked, and 40 percent of my high end was gone. You have yeah. the same. Do you, you earplugs yeah. or no? Now I do, yeah. But I don't use. Do I don't. It, here's the here's the trick. You got to use the the. I have ones for you. They're not. They're not. They don't use the foam ones. Those take out too much. I have these rubber ones that they give to airport employees. Oh. You put them in. And um, you don't put them in for the first segue. The first two or three songs, you leave them out. So you get your adrenaline pumping. And then you put them in, and it calms it down. And it makes it sound clearer. And you're like, oh, it sounds clearer. I can hear. And then you're still excited, so you play the show with excitement. And if you want, you can take it out the last song just to like, what does it sound like again? Interesting. That helps. You, you, you have tendonitis too, Adam? Yeah, I have... I have uh... I don't know what frequencies I've lost, but I've high lost frequencies. a ton of them. That's yeah, what we lose from yeah. the symbols and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. You lose the highs show. first. Yeah. 40% in 96, it's got to be bad It's got to be bad. Yeah. now. I, like when there's background noise, I don't hear very well. I don't think tendonitis doesn't bother me, but I, if I think about it, my head's going right now. When you close your... you? I don't happens have to you too. That. You probably don't notice yeah. it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's because you just live, live with it. I mean, I know we've been standing on stages for close to, what, 25 years? Yeah. Volume up to eleven. Yeah, you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. No earplugs. Like, you don't get it's out of weird. that yeah, without I can't, damage. I can't, yeah, I can't. People with the inner ear monitors never could do that, man. No, it's you not. It's not, it's not our right. thing. Yeah. I, I, I can't even do earplugs because to me the volume is part of the energy it of the is, show. Man. You know yes. what I mean? You want to feel it. Yeah, I want to feel it. Like um, in ear monitors, I could play like that, playing some other type of music. If I was playing other type of music for hardcore punk, no, yeah, you can't. You need the power. It's like even yeah. in the studio with the headphones on, I feel like like weird. neutered. You, you know almost I mean? don't know what it's going to sound like till you yeah. hear it complete. Then yeah. you're like, oh wow, it came out good. It sounded so tame when we were recording it. I like the yeah. chaos, like yeah, the yeah. sonic madness of it all. Like yeah, that's yeah. that's fun to me. Some of that, that slop can be. Some of that slop is nice. Some of that slop is really what you're feeling. Yeah. You know what I mean, I want to say that I want to say the sick of it all, kind of like. Changed the game for hardcore because you guys are the first ones to go on tour like Neopalm Death, Sacred Rite, Separator. Mix it up, man. Nobody, no bands were doing it back then. Everybody stayed in their own genre, and you guys did that. I think that changed the game for you guys. Yeah, it, you and know, the to a different audience. Thing, you know what I mean? Different level of professionalism too. Yeah, 
that was like the second wave of that crossover thing. The crossover thing started in like 85, I guess. And then like 89, it like kind of resurfaced again. But those guys toured a lot with bands like that. And listen, it's always good to mix up bills. 100%. Preachers it's good to converted, mix up yeah. bills. You want to like play with we bands that, that play stuff that's a little different. You know what I mean? You go on tour with your Dropkick Murphys. You go on tour with your metal brand, your hate, yeah. your hate breed, your... You know rancid, saying? you guys mix rancid. it up. Yeah, you want, yeah, you want a little bit of everything. We did misfits in there. together. That was yes, a great right. tour, man. That was a fun tour. Great tour. That was really fun. My wife was got, that was that long. Your wife got locked. My wife got locked up at one of the shows in nineteen ninety six. It was a big fight at the show. That was a fight. Um, it started in L A. Wasn't the first show I, in L A. Yeah, I feel like we went. Halloween. That was a long tour. It was Halloween. A long tour. Halloween. I think it was. Misfits did uh, Star Trek. We did Baseball Furies. And I can't yeah, remember. I remember that show. Um, and this not to like. To bring the, the the thing down, but I remember we played that show and the doors are wrong, so we played like really early. And there's nobody there, and we were dressed up like. Remember that we were dressed up like them. It was like rough. Was that over man. here in LA? Palladium. Now yeah, that was the Palladium. It was rough so for us. I, I remember on that tour we played Milwaukee. Metal and f- Bob Dylan was playing upstairs. And Bob, oh, remember that? Fuck Bob Dylan. Yeah, I right. Remember. Because ahead, he then. wouldn't. He could hear. The, the opening band for the show, there's a band number four in his dressing room and said he wasn't going to do his show if our show was going on at the same time. There but were then, two venues. Then he, didn't right. he offer to pay us our guarantees? I don't remember that. Really? I, just, I think he said, I'll pay all of your guarantees if you don't play. That's what it came to yeah. after the first. And then and then we ended up just having to wait till like we fucking like, a week. Yeah, but we were like, we were like play fuck you. Why not? Yeah, We're fuck not. Bob we, Dylan. We, we, yo, Bob Dylan, man. We got fans. What do you think? Yeah. Our, our fans are... We have feverish fans that are like yeah. hungry for hardcore. Yeah, I mean, come on, who did this guy? We're think serving he was? it up. He was being a dick. Were you in sick of it all when I um, I can I introduced them to House of Pain? Then that 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 song happened. Mm, that was right before I joined. Oh, okay, it was a Jump Around remix. That was, came yeah, out that was right when time. that came out. That came out right when I joined. You're like, check out this thing we just yeah. did. Yeah, that was such yeah. a good time back then too. All like crossover shit with hip hop. Yeah, and, it's cool to mix it all up. Yeah. Fucking Adam. Any questions? Any more questions? Jimmy? Any more questions for Craig ahead? Mm. I got a couple. Uh, the only one I have is I feel like I feel like the, like hardcore is a genre that there's always reunions that go on. Yeah, and good, one yeah. reunion that I've always thought that doesn't has never happened, and I think people would wig out if it happened would be uh, one voice lineup. Yeah, Show me. there's been some talk of that. You know, there's there was talk of that happening at the Super Bowl. You know, the, excuse me, the black and blue bowl. Um, there was talk of that happening, and uh, it just never really came to anything. If I'm Yet. listen, I'm not in. Ta- I'm never in town. To get all of that us together at a time when it would work would be hard. Yeah, I th- and also I want to say I think you really you've always been a smart guy, like with your money and finances and all that, and you have like a crib and like a, a thing upstate. I think it's really cool you did that with your money. That, that's from hardcore. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, I try to. I try. You know, what do I really need? Yeah. What do I need? I need. I need You're a minimalist. I'm a minimalist. You yeah. really are. I mean, I'm not like a minimalist to the point where I'm like living in a, in a van, but I don't need like I'm not about bling. What am I gonna do? Yeah. You what do I like, need? Yeah, vegetables. That you grow vegetables at your crib. I and grow stuff? vegetables at my farm and stuff. And so Sick. I, you know, I the money. Most of the the money I spend, the main money I spend, is on food, eating good organic, uh, uh, vegetarian food. Yeah. I, I try to eat uh, clean healthy food that I mainly prepare myself. Yeah. So I like to cook, so I, I do that. And um, You've always, you were cooking backstage in some yeah. of those tours. You've I'm, into, I'm into riding motorcycles now, though. That's mm. like a new thing. I bought like a little like uh, dual purpose bike, like a 250, and I was riding it upstate, so I just bought like a Triumph Tiger, a 2018, an 800, and I want to do a trip uh, out to Arizona next next year. Is that part of your midlife crisis or just want to get it just fell of it? It's both. <laughs> but I, I know what it is. It, it, that, that, that wind therapy feels great. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I just love, a big up, I love being upstate and then I get on a bike yeah. and I just go out in the morning and ride all day. It's just such a... So, it's so, so it's life, dude. You're like living life. Just, you yeah. feel so it sounds, it sounds like you kind of got it all figured out in the end. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you do. I enjoy it. But so I, now I spend, <laughs> a little, I spend a little bit of money on motorcycles, you know? Yeah. But um, yeah, what are you, really, what are you really going to do with my... You've always been like that. I think you've always been the smart, like save money, I mattress, save money, all that I shit. save money. But I'm not like a businessman. It's not like I open businesses to be rich. Because you mon- invest in shit. But mo- money, money isn't the drive. It's no. not like I want more money. I'm not obsessed with money. No, I know. You, I you, just want to be just, happy. But the money you made, you're smart with it. I want to be happy. Yeah, I want to be happy. I want to set myself where yeah. I feel like I take my mom to my farm almost every time I go. Yeah. And we spend the weekends at the farm and like, you know, we spend time up there. And it's like the great, it's like so nice. She, her health is great. My mother's almost 80 yeah. years old. Her health is great because we have that place to go. Yeah. You know, do you worry about the future? Take my girl Did up there. She loves it. It's great. Do you worry about the future? Not so much. A little bit. But then I think to myself, everything's good. Life is good. Yeah, totally. You're a decent person. You've done 
you're trying hard to be a good guy. You've been through some dark times for sure. Yeah, I've been dark through dark shit. times, and now I know. No, that's like, a different episode. So I kind of feel like, you know, things are going to work out for me for the most part. Don't worry yourself sick about it. Don't worry. Just keep doing what you're doing. Do you feel like you got through all the trauma growing up through your music all these years? You still feel like yeah, pretty much. You ever seen a therapist? Uh, not really. Me either. Once. once oh, I need to see one about. My once dad. I I saw a therapist one time when all of this stuff came to a head because in, uh, in my in my late teen early 20s i'd say all of this came to a head and that's sort of where i went from being this guy that kind of let people push it push him not really push me around but this guy that was like oh okay i'll just let it happen and like i would whatever happened happened and i just kind of like didn't really like control situations that i should have controlled and just let them sort of give everyone too much freedom yeah in a way and then at a certain point i looked like uh you know something i gotta like stand up for mine and at that point, it was like uh, I went a little too far in that direction. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and and at that point, I saw a therapist one time. Talk, my, you know, I talk a lot. You hear, yeah, you yeah. Hear me? I, yeah. I just fucking babbled for like two hours. But you seem like you're an optimist. Left. Yeah, I'm an optimist. Yeah, yeah you, you know like me. That. Yeah, for sure. I'm an optimist. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm an easy target. I'm you an can open definitely book. break balls still, but you're still, I know you're still a positive person. But like, you know, how some people are guarded. Like they don't yeah. say much. They don't open up. I open up like too much, and people yeah. and, like people look like, oh, I could throw a snowball at this guy bang and kindness for weakness yeah plus uh, it's it's an easy target you're mm-hmm. like that you open up a lot 100 percent. and people look like see the i go after you you go after me yeah. even though we're both the same pretty yeah. much but people see weakness though they see, they see all your cards your whole deck of cards when you do they that, see you a whole I mean? deck of cards i don't even think it's so much weakness as much as it's just there's a freedom there yeah what do you have any daily rituals <sighs> besides coffee and you had uh, to make coffee has but i don't works out every single day but mm. Not, not. Re- I used to have rituals with with exercise, yeah, physical fitness that I don't really, I should stick to, but I don't. I really don't stick to my physical fitness. Like I did boxing, used to be every morning get up and do your boxing stuff, but at a certain point, it, I look like nobody's going to be hitting me in the head anymore, so there's no threat, so it, it's not that important. But um, when I'm home in the morning, as 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 generic as this is, I get up, I go to like a local coffee shop in my neighborhood, and my brother in law and his friends are there, and I sit down with them when I'm off tour, Sick. and and just talk scratch with these like sixty plus year old guys, yeah, for like an hour or two, and we yeah. just crack crack jokes on each other and hang out, and I'll do that, and when I do that for a few days in a row, like a week straight, when I'm home. I feel like I'm. I find like it like settles me in. It's like yeah. okay, the tour is over. You're home now. So I do that four or five days, three or four days in a row. Then I go upstate, and then I can go like twice a week. You know, I'll go see him on like Monday, and then again on Wednesday. Yeah, it, but it calms me down. It's like some yeah. settling in it, thing. It, it, it's something interesting about if you go on tours over a certain duration. When you come home, there's definitely like a turn like a, off like a turn off switch but it's like a ship like it doesn't stop on a dime it like it slows yeah. it's true. down yeah it's really true but i can get real lazy when i'm home when Me i've been too. out touring a lot i can yeah. just be like they'll be i'll be like jesus i haven't like done anything in five days i've just been laying down and like mm-hmm. taking get a showers wife. and that's that, true that's that'll true. get you snapped that's true you're not, ma- you're not married right you're not right. married that's right. i live with my girl okay okay oh. so it's it's the same as being married just without the did paper. you ever want to be a dad yeah, but I, 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 you know, it's a hard thing for me because I would love to be a father, and I think you'd I'd be, be a great a father. father man. Yeah, you'd be awesome. But the thing is, it, it's with my touring schedule. But the other guys have kids too, married. The other guys do it too, man. The whole band does it. Yeah, you're like the only one. But I also think that my childhood has there's something in the back of my head that scares me about that. No, I hear you. I, I don't walk you. around afraid about it. But I, I think because of that, you'd be even better father. There's like you wanna... some shock still in there where mm. I'm like, I can't bring a kid into this, even though I'm nice. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it yeah. seems like you have a good setup to have a kid. You have the play thing up, like the farm. You have the regular spot. Like, good setup. Yeah. Maybe a dog. We talk about getting a dog. <laughs> but um, but you're not saying no to not not saying no to being a dad ever, right? No, no not saying no. But at this age, I'd have to make a move quick. Yeah. My my, uh, my nephew. When I met my I met my whole side of my family from my father's earlier marriage when yeah. I was 25. So I met my nephew at the time I was 25. He was like 15 or 16. And uh, we became close friends quickly. And I kind of older brothered him, kind of fathered him, uncled him. I'm his uncle technically. Yeah. So I taught, he was like a shy kid like I was. And I kind of helped him, taught him about like, uh, I taught him boxing. Yeah. Which taught him discipline and perseverance. That was like a metaphor for life in a way. Hell yeah. And, um, and I helped him with girls. He was at the age where he wanted, he was like girls. And he was shy. He was like I was. He was like really shy and introverted. And I sort of helped him 
come out of his shell in a way that was like real, like with boxing. It's like, no, we're going to do another round. We're going to do another round. You're going to give me all you got. Come on. Like stuff like that. You know what I mean? And with the girl, be nice to her. Don't be too nice, but be nice. You know, like I would teach him little lessons <laughs> of like how to sort of maneuver. And uh, he's a man with a family now. He's a good wow. guy. He's nice. great. He's, he's a great guy. You know, he turned into like a guy like that you can totally count on. Almost scares me a little bit now. Yeah. Like, wow. This guy's like a, it's like this guy's, like a, real, yeah, this guy's yeah. like a real go-getter. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like you and Adam have similarities to that. We like you came from sheltered experiences and with girls and you were shy. Then you came yeah. out of your show in a band. You guys went kind of wild. It's went kind of wild. You yeah. both were wild guys, man. Yeah. Yeah, you went wild for a, for quite a bit. Yeah, I followed in your footsteps. <laughs> I don't know if it's my footsteps, but yeah, I, I, I abused myself for a while. Yeah, I think I think I think you know, like as a young young guy, if you were shy and you were insecure, like a lot of people that pick Self, up music, you're trying to up your self worth. Yeah, you you get out on the road, and all of a sudden, people are interested in you in that regard. Like in I the bands, all just, that. Of course, you're gonna take advantage of all the opportunities. Presented. All the stuff that you were scared of, you go and yeah. like just like overdose on it. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I can get this girl, I can get that girl, I can you know. I can light up this whole room, make friends with everybody in this room. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You Did become you feel like, the opposite of what you were. Yeah. Did you feel like you were addicted to it back then or had a sickness? You, you remember. Were, you know. Yeah, but I don't want to get too You're, deep if you don't want to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You remember like the times when I was like not taking care of myself. Yeah. Well, and I would go crazy and do dumb stuff. Yeah. And that was like pain though. That was pain. Like, you know what I mean? That was like. Pain from pain from growing up? That's how Growing like, up and like being taken advantage of in spots with like, you know, in my early experiences when I was too nice to people. Yeah. People like talking to me in a way that showed no respect just because I let them by being too nice. But I don't yeah. walk around with a chip on my shoulder either. If somebody's going to come at me in a certain way, I don't have to really deal with them. You know what yeah. I mean? As long as they don't follow me out the door when I'm leaving, then there's not going to be a problem. But yeah, people will look at you like. You know, like, oh, I could take from this guy. I guess you can, but, you, you know, I guess you can, but what are you really getting? Yeah. You got no, you got no, you got no shot of being anywhere near me again. You know what yeah, I mean? You get yeah. to take it once. You get to take it once and that's it. You know what I mean? And then all, most of the people that, that did that later on would be like, oh man, you're doing pretty well. Like I saw you on TV and I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, okay, yeah. You know, I've had girls that have like, you know. Like, oh, you're always on tour and this and that and that and this and that and this. And then you do something stupid. And I'm like, nah, we're not friends anymore. That's it. And they look like later on, I'm like, oh, I want to see you again. I, I, you know, no. Now that I started making some money yeah. and then you see yeah. me on TV, you want to be my buddy. Not that I'm all that, but you get the yeah, idea. Yeah. It's like, like what, do you, what do you think this is? You know what I mean? What do you think I am? You know yeah. what I mean? I'm not saying pride to a fault. I'm just saying like. I'm worth something. You, know you feel like mean? you had your guard up your whole life because you've been yeah. taking advantage of for yeah, sure. Yeah, but I try not to be that way. I try. Yeah. Not, I still want to be the open. I still want to be like the open way you are, yeah, the way yeah. I am. Yeah, we're open to a point where we're easy to throw a dart at and hit. The whole board's open. Just throw the dart. Yeah. You're gonna hit something. But if I'm guarded, that's not me being me. It's not, man. That, that's not you, my nature. You, you got to swing from one all the way to the other. Then the pendulum comes back and sits right in the middle, which is the best place for it. Well said. It's really well said. It's true, you. though. You guys talk. I'll, I'll let me. Just no, but I, but I feel like Adam. I feel like yeah. You guys have been through a lot of shit, and now here you are, still playing music, and yeah, it's awesome, man. It's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy yeah, we, about we it. We kind of kind of won in a kind of won, kind of won. Yeah, it looked like we were losing a lot of that time, though, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, a lot you of know? sacrifice, man. A lot of sacrifice. Yeah, and we don't really know what the end game is going to be. We, obviously, we keep playing if kids keep coming. We love yeah. playing. You know what I mean? Like end game is a weird thing. Yeah. Like I was talking to uh, some family members about, oh, like, what are you gonna do? I'm like, I I'm not too worried about it. No. Like, but you should. And I'm like, well, what is there to do these days? They're like, well, um, um, and they look at the end. In the end, they're like, you know, what are you really gonna do? You, you're not gonna go to school at this point. Really. Yeah, at 50 you years old, I'm gonna go to college. Yeah. No, you're not doing that. You know. Yeah. I mean, all and of our business is like such a trap. Like dealing with the world, like it's it's like a, a lot of it's a big trap. Yeah. All depending of depending on what you're doing, obviously. We all started on a path when we were basically children, you know, and and we're still. It was something that seemed like a ridiculous dream almost, you know? And then, like, here we are, like, 30, you're 30, 25 years later, still living that dream. Half of it was being lazy and just wanting to, like, run out and play all day instead of doing your work. That's yeah. a lot of it, too. It's like you were, like, the lazy kid that somehow, reality. somehow didn't deal with reality, but somehow found this magical place that's half twisted, and you're there now, and you're like, wow, how did me being lazy with responsibility and only doing what I wanted to do, turn into a good life. It's that fucking people, crazy, that, man. That, that's looked at as like a success story. I don't really understand yeah. that. And it's, we're still big kids. So I we do, go, but regardless if you're married, Adam, and we, I, we have a house and mortgage and 
you own houses too. It's like my mortgage still, is almost up. My but, mortgage is up this year. But we're still a big kid. You're still a big kid, though, don't you think? Yeah. Because you, when going on tour is not reality. There's no responsibility about playing a show. But that that reality we thought that we had to to adhere to. Yeah. The, like you know the the adult you know two point five children type thing. You know what I mean? It's not reality. Yeah. That's a hollow dream. And I'm not saying a family isn't good. Yeah. I'm saying all the trappings that go with it that society puts on you is a, is like a hollow dream. The unit, the family unit, the love, the communication, yeah. that's not a trap. It's but not. I'm just saying that what you thought you had to live up to, you didn't have to live up to it financially. You had to live up to it emotionally. Yeah. Do you understand yeah, what I'm saying? 100%, yeah. 100%. And I feel like all of our success... That being said, I'm scared to have kids. But, but I'm saying all, but all of our success right here is not based on money. It's based on, based on still doing what we love and inspiring people and fucking being healthy. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, like we, it's not about money. By being fuck ups, we did something good. Yeah, I wasn't. I mean, I, I was always looking. I thought I was looked at as always like the stupid roadie who shit himself, did pussy boy, run around, did stupid shit. I wasn't supposed to do anything, and and I'm, um, you know, what I mean, I was a joke. My yeah, band, but and everything. You, but you were the same. We were doing the same thing. Yeah. The only difference was I put years into playing an instrument. So yeah. okay, so what did you do? You liked all the same music. You yeah. heard it, and you have a musical ear. So it didn't take much for you to. Yeah, it's not about like, oh, this guy is so talented. That doesn't mean that much. It means how what you do. You yeah. know what I mean? None yeah. of us are real. We're, we're musicians when that band started. You were. You played, but like Rusty didn't play guitar before. Yeah, it's it's our friend still plays drums. Wild, it's my boy. I love it's him. How it goes? You know, know what I'm mean? saying? I'm like, it's it but just it's, works for that, us. That doesn't matter as much. Yeah, you know, people look like, oh, you must be really good. I'm like, I can play well, but I don't need to play really well. I need to play what I play well. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's not like you need to be some like fancy Dan or anything like that. You just need to. You know. It's funny. I went to I went to music school full time for a year, and I've never used a single thing I learned. I bet in the field. I bet that's crazy. Yeah, never like never like runs and stuff like that. I mean, not not nothing that like I wasn't doing before I went to music school. I got you it. know what I mean? Like, when still you, trying to be Steve Harris. You when know you what I mean? run this to that, you just know it. Instinctively yeah, it's just, it's just there. I don't out. know if it's mixolydian and alien. Mo- I don't know any of yeah, that I scale understand. stuff. I, I, I know I know some of those terms, yeah. but I never think them. No, I never sit there and no. think them when I'm yeah, playing. Can you read music? I can read tablature, but not music. Yeah, I, I, Max I've been, is reading music. I've been working on reading music and uh. You know, I just need to do it steadily for a few weeks yeah. to have it down. I read tab just to figure out old Motown lines. Yeah, but, um, that's cool. It would be yes. good. It would be, it would be good to read to read music. I mean, I could do it. I I, I I've, I've started doing it. I just haven't yeah. gotten it down to a point where it's automatic. Yeah. Like I could read it and play it yeah. like through. I could if I spent like a month working yeah. on it an hour a day. Yeah. I mean, I, I I learned to sight read bass clef, and I've once again the minute I left music school, I've never sight read bass clef. Yeah, since. yeah, you know, tab, tab is like, <laughs> yeah, tab is like painting by simple. numbers. I love it. Tab, yeah, tab is just so you can like, how does that bass line go? So you don't have to sit yeah. there and figure when you're figuring out James Jamerson lines. Yeah, instead of going the long route by that standing in the shadows of Motown book, yeah, you yeah, get yeah, to yeah. work and you, and you go uh, and so so, but a lot of those lines though, like when you study his lines. You think about the root chords, uh-huh. the, you know, and then you see how he combines it, and it's like, okay, I get what this guy's doing. I fully get it. I use that sometimes in the stuff I do. I I wrote a line for a song on the new album, and uh, actually Armand came up with the part of the line. And then he got me going. He goes, something like this. I go, oh, that's good. And then I changed it, and then I put it in another part, and it sounds like it's a total James Jamerson bass line. And that's it just it. popped out. And that's because leading up to the recording of the last album, I was playing Motown stuff at home on my acoustic bass, playing along to records and, like, you know, brushing up on all that stuff. It's and, awesome. Uh, totally wrote, like, a Jamerson line. You wouldn't be able to tell because it's a hardcore song. It's like an oi song. But I'm like, oh, it sounds like that's like something Jamerson would do. You know what I mean? I I think one of the greatest things about music is that you could put on a record, play along with that record, and you can feel a little bit about, a little bit like what the guy making that record felt. You know what I mean? If you put on like, I don't know, like a a Ramones record and you play along with it, you kind of feel like you're a Ramon. Yeah, you get get like... You get that little (laughs) taste. You get the little little taste. taste. Yeah. (laughs) It's, uh, It's crazy though. Sometimes with like bass players, like certain styles you hear a fill or a run and you just can do it right in a second but then a guy like jamerson has his own little signature things he does and they're not your signature thing so you hear it and to do it it feels weird you're like i can do this but it's like i would do something a little different yeah so you put your own flavor in there but you also want to learn exactly how he does it so you can get his little signature quick little snap fills. I'll call them snap fills because they're like little jump-ins. But each guy has his own little snap fill 
uh, you know, routine. Some base mafia talk. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's 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 we're discussing, we're discussing um, the low end. W- Craig, what are some advice you can give somebody that wants to start a band or be a musician? Uh, play because you like to. Don't yeah, play, play because, because you love you, it. Don't play because you have to. Play what you like, and you can change it up, but don't change it up because I don't like this anymore. This sucks. Now I like this because now I'm more underground than you. Just play what you like. I feel like you guys never change your shit either. You know what it is? It's, we got a more singing here and there. Yeah, you got a little to. Oil a little bit here and there, but like you guys never like. Those influences are always there. You know totally. what I mean? Like I'm into like, a, you know, we're all into oil. And yeah. Like, the, like the, you know, like, like DC, same DC stuff, shit. Yeah. stuff that influence you guys. Yeah. So it's a lot of that. You know what I mean? Obviously yeah. the Ramones, but like um, the way we play, we play so heavy handed that anything we play sounds like us because we're very like aggressive players. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes I'm always like, Armand, I'm like, stop trying to play so hard and pull back on this. He's like, I can't. I'm like, okay. Like he, he, <laughs> he can't not play like super hard. You know what I yeah, mean? He's it's just the way he, <laughs> it's the way he plays though, but he's got, he's got that style. Yeah. You know what I, mean? I want to end this with the Ian McKay story. Oh, you're talking about the song? Yeah. So uh, I, <laughs> I, I forget what album it was. I think it was maybe yours truly. So, uh, Trevor Silmsler, you know, Trevor? shout him out. He's the one who told me to start a podcast. Shout Tre- out Tre- Trevor. Tre- Trevor, what's up? T Bone, Trevor Silms was my buddy. <laughs> he actually helped sick of it all with management years, yeah, he did. years ago. And, uh, so he was, he was helping us with, he was like managing us. And, um, you have a great voice for this, by the way. Your voice sounds amazing on this. I usually sound squeaky. Sounds great. Go ahead. Okay. Probably because I got a sore throat. Go ahead. I'm babbling so much. Sounds like Paul Giamatti. That actor for some reason. <laughs> what? That guy's a good actor. Great. Your voice sounds like him. Go ahead. Billions is a good show. Great. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. <laughs> 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 so, uh, you know, we were talking, hey, it would, be, it would be great to get Ian McKay to sing. Ian McKay, I'll call him. To sing on. It's McKay. But go ahead. Uh, yeah, whatever, dude. Go ahead. So, <laughs> sing, a, sing on one of, our, one of our songs. So Trevor reaches out to him and he goes, yeah, I'll check it out. You know, okay, cool. So we had a tape, a rehearsal tape, where it was just like a little tape recorder. It's like the 90s. A little tape recorder in a room. So it just sounds like pure white noise. It's like, <laughs> you hear click, 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 click. <laughs> it just sounds like noise, right? Yeah. So I had this little thing at home where you could play a tape and you could put another track over it. But it was like real like ghetto, like not pro. You could just like loop something else onto the tape. And it would stand out in a weird way, and it wouldn't sound right. So what happened was, these are called like scratch vocals, kind of right? For it was people. just so I was I had I'd written this, the last song on that record. I was like, Lou, I have the vocal line. I go, there's a melody there, and I would hum the melody to him. And I was like, I'm just gonna give you the cadence because the cadence was weird. I go, I'm gonna whisper onto this thing I have to put it over the noisy rehearsal track. Yeah, yeah. So I just did like a. <laughs> and it totally doesn't match the music because it's like white noise, but he got the timing of the words. I had the words on the sheet, so he would look at the sheet, and he'd be, bah, 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 bah. and then it was up to him, and I said, once you get the, 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 the cadence down, we'll work on the little lines that had a little tail, it had a slight melody to it. He goes, okay, so we made this tape, so the tape was of the song that Ian was we going to ask him to sing on. So I think that I went to see Trevor in the city and I was like, yo, T, give this to Lou. He's coming in later or the next day. Or give this to Lou. He needs to get this tape. It's that song so he understands the vocals. So Trevor, not thinking, is like, oh, it's that song with the vocal line? And he sends it to Ian. <laughs> and it's like the most embarrassed. It's the craziest sounding thing you've ever heard. If you would have heard this, you'd be like, what is this? This is like... <laughs> It would be the funniest thing you ever heard in your so life. So the hardest mu- music with like the humming in it, like talk, yeah, not even hard, just like the noisiest crap, like non-music, just <laughs> with with. <laughs> and I'd say stuff like "Hold the end," you know, like it was and like stuff, he- <laughs> stuff like like it was done in like a way not for listening, just for him to read the paper and get started and that's what Ian it. got and that's what he got and he was like I don't think I'll be uh, I think this you know it doesn't sound like it's right for me to sing on it but good luck with the record I'm sure it's gonna be really good <laughs> <laughs> that song made the record yeah Damn. and I think we sent him the record and he's like wow it's really good I think he said something like wow it sounds good like I, you know I, I, wow I think he was shocked like wow what the hell <laughs> that's <laughs> amazing man but he must have known we were a real band so he must have been like what is this like, but yeah he didn't sing you on that have any more questions for Craig he didn't I sing have, on that record nothing. Do you have any, have any well, last one? Do you have any re- regrets? Regrets? Yeah. Uh, with your career or anything? Or just anything? With my career, not not so much. 
I wish I would have messed around with other music a little more. Yeah. I did on the side, but never anything I put out. I should have just put out everything. Creep Division was awesome too. That was fun. That was yeah. fun. I had like I have like acoustic based stuff I wrote that I should mm. just put out. But you still can. It's just like pretty music. You know what I mean? I don't know it's pretty stuff too, yeah. I, I still could, I guess, yeah. Uh reg- I have other regrets personally, like like dumb stuff like Yeah. Should have knocked this guy out. Should have knocked that. I was too nice to this person. People, I should have like, dumped that girl earlier. Should have dumped that girl earlier. Should have like you know. Should have spit in her face and punched the guy in the regrets face. Regrets of being human. But that yeah, regrets so of, being of being human. human. But at the cost same time, human. at the same time, like, what are you gonna do? Yeah, you're going on tour. You live hundreds of miles away, or these are people you don't see. So what are you yeah. gonna do? You're gonna spend more time in a situation that's shit. Yeah. Just fucking put it behind you and keep going. You know what I mean? Top top five most influential musicians or artists. I'm going to do it too. You're talking about bands or players? Yeah, whatever. Band, artist, yeah. Uh, Black Sabbath, Giza Butler. Sick. OG Vegan too. What up? Yep, yep. Um, uh, Bad Brains. Yeah. And Daryl is a bass player. Huge. Sick. Amazing. Uh, you know, you got to say the Ramones just because they kind of are the spark of all of this. And Queens represent. And Queens represent. So just based on Queens and the spark. And I love the band. Yeah. But I'm not going to say I was into the Ramones in the 70s because I wasn't. I discovered them. Later on, yeah. Later on. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the Ramones, you can't play with that. Um, Ramones, Bad Brains, Black Sabbath, so good. So uh, far. F- you know, I don't know who else. You can't really. say a band you were in though, right? No, really. I'm not going to say a band I was in. So I can't. I, yeah, AF, like... It, Victim in Pain is like the poster child album for hardcore. Yeah. New York, if you had to describe New York hardcore to somebody 100 years from now, you'd say, listen to this, and you'd give them Victim in Pain. Yeah. Because that really describes it to me. That's the essence of New York hardcore right there. I listened, to, to be, I listened to it on the plane coming here, actually. That's to be in the top five then, I think. That is like, that album is like New York hardcore without any attitude. I mean, yeah. other attitude than what it really is, yeah. is yeah yeah, it, yeah. It's, a, it's a test it's a landmark from a time like a time capsule from that era of new york city yeah yeah I what gotta, about hip-hop no, i gotta i gotta, I gotta give danny local props for helping me get for, for watering the seed yeah i don't, I don't know no nah, nah, probably not hip-hop it's not my top five i'm just talking about five things that were influential no i hear to you me. black sabbath john entwistle from the who i used mm. to learn, i used to learn all his bass lines when i was a kid because he was all over the place and i was like you know, I learned box patterns and how to combine stuff. And I was like, okay, this is pretty simple the way this guy plays, but it sounds yeah. so good. Simple, but it's like good. You know what yeah. I mean? I learned a lot from him. And as far as influence, I mean, I love Minor Threat. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's good. Minor Threat, Black Sabbath, Bad Brains. Yeah. AF. Uh, the, the Who. <laughs> the Who, that's a good one. What about you, Adam? What'd you go for five? Five? Uh, I Am Maiden, for sure. Damn, Maiden. I liked. I liked the yeah. first two albums a lot. I, I like Dick, the Dickens and Eras. Like not so much. I saw. I saw him on that a couple of times. Like I went to see him play, but I didn't. Make, Stop yeah. bragging, bro. He wasn't. Uh, no, I'm saying he wasn't as good. No, I know. Uh, I saw him at the Island too. Talk, it was are better. We talk, are we talking Even just though it wasn't technically as whatever. Good. I say top five. Yeah, right. Um, Bruce Lee for sure. Damn, not born Bruce, Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee's a bad. Yeah, Bruce Lee because like as you become a Bruce Lee fan and you learn a little bit more about the philosophy, you learn and it's it's kind of punk rock in a way. It's a lot about you know, questioning an established dogma. And Evander Holyfield was a big influence. Yeah, on me and like being that willing to because he to, never gave up and he was smaller. Um, t- wow, it's hard. I gotta, I gotta give Ray Capo props. Nice for for being the person you know the, the through his lyrics like influencing me yeah. to open my mind up to to you know spirituality, which wasn't that. something I was particularly open to. Um, Cod, I don't know. Five. It's, it's like this. How about Jimmy like G this. for exposing you to women? Jim, G, well, Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy G, and Todd were the people, and and, and my brothers in H two O were the time. people that took me out of being a shy nerdy kid who yeah. went on to be, live in a Harry Krishna temple and basically Word. live a monastic lifestyle. And were like, hey, bird, look at this. You know, they open like the. <laughs> the, the Playboy, the sweetie shop, the candy yeah, store. Yeah. They, they opened. You know they mean? opened Playboy yeah. and gave you a joint. How many is that? Is that three, four? It's three. That's three. Oh my god! I got to do two more. Um, two more artists that had massive influence on me. Yeah, <sighs> Oasis. No, what's that? Nah, what's the other yeah, but the, I, I love those. I love those Britpop bands, but they yeah. didn't. They didn't impact me like that heart, like deeply heart. as a person. Yeah. Um, ACDC. Uh, no. It's really hard to say. It's who really hard. Like, nah, you, nah. these are the bands I like. Be- because, yeah. like, if you asked me when I was thirteen, Jesus, I could have answered the question. But, but you asked me now as a, a how, how old am I? What is it? Forty six. Forty six. A forty six year old man. I have a lifetime of influences True. and movies yeah, and books, yeah, eras yeah. and different, conversations I've different, had with different people parts of your your and experiences that, that was, have. Shaped, you know that, different experience. That did you? You know, what I mean, Tony Robbins would have been one. Back Tony here. Robbins is huge. I love Tony Robbins. Yeah. So, so potentially him. 
um, he he definitely you know inspired me in in realizing that you can re-engineer your own brain, which is pretty. Brilliant. Yeah, you did that too for sure. Yeah, you definitely did that. Um, I can't think of of um, uh, this is a horrible answer. I can't think my, of five people. My brother-in-law Charlie helped me. He like taught me like you can do business without being afraid because you're the one doing the business. You control it. Yeah, that's true. He taught me how to like take command in a business situation. Totally doesn't work with Armand because he's a control freak, but it works when I'm doing my own financials. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it just, he taught me how to, con- how to drive the deal. And I was like, it's kind of like Tony Robbins type stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, okay. And I look like, this is me. This is me and my stuff. I got to be the one in charge. Yeah, so that was a big influence to me. And you maneuvered pretty well from leaving high school at such a young age and just getting your GED. You did yeah. a lot in your life. I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing okay. Yeah, I'm not bad, man. I it's feel fine. like we've barely scratched the surface. This <laughs> You're yeah, don't joking. Don't start that. <laughs> what about you, bud? Five year plan. You know what? Yeah, who's knows? your top five? Toby no, no, Morse? I'm talking about five year plan. You know what? You know what five year plan's about? It's about how this guy in like what year? 1994. Right. How he had f- basically five years to live before it all collapses. That's really <laughs> That's what good. it's about. It's pretty true. Five years from now, we'll be, wow, and it turned yeah. to 25 years, man. But we, I used to Fuck. say the same thing. Like, what am I going to do? I'm in this band. Yeah. Like, we used to say that to each other. It's like, true. It is true. It, it, it was like, it, wait. Gonna go. I didn't. I did. I wrote my own history. I guess in a sense, writing that song. What am I going to do in five years? And it, it, it's a timeless myself. question. You can ask that question now. Yeah. Five years from now, where will I be? Yeah, it's true, man. Yeah, but now it's not so bad. Yeah, but back then I was like, what? What is the future going to entail? Am I going to do this band? Is this yeah. going to happen? Like, it's a good. It point, was a weird man. turning point. It was a really weird turning point. It was where it went from like our hobby, fun thing, and we were kids messing around to like this is what we're going to do from yeah. pretty much forever. Yeah. It's like, which is, I'm happy about it. Yeah. I mean, he went from shelter, fired back to England, two weeks later back trying out for H2O. Actually, yeah, I never tried it. out for H2O. Oh, I, you just like you guys are in the band. Oh, shit. Perfect. You're in the band. And I was like, okay, thanks, guys. But you, you, got the, you got the disease. We all got it. Mm-hmm. It's in our blood. We all have the disease. We all have the blood disease. That's, that's you know, music. Yeah. And our yeah. particular music, it's like a slightly twisted form of that disease. But we all have that disease. Yeah. It doesn't leave. It doesn't go away. Boxing's the same way. You get like that in your blood and it's like you're obsessed with it your whole life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. If, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm anywhere in the world and, and something comes on, on the speakers and it's got a great riff... My right hand just it just starts, it starts going, going. You know what I mean? I can't <laughs> help it. It just starts moving. The fingers start trying to find it in the air. You know, it's never leaves you. It's just it's there. Yeah. And just think about life if you didn't have it. Like if Adam, if we just stayed home now, we're just married, stayed home, did other things, and <clears throat> didn't have the way to go out there and play music. It's so scary thinking about it, it sucks. That's kinda of scary for That me, release, yeah. that release, you know what I mean? I would like, have I would have no regrets because I'm incredibly proud of the stuff we've done. True. But I would there would be a little hole there. I would miss it. I would miss it. Imagine never going on tour again. Happy and we've been off for a little while. Imagine, too, so. yeah. imagine music being 100% over from this day forward. Yeah, it man. would just be traumatic as hell. It's so but traumatic, man. It would be hard. But sometimes you're out there like, man, I'm going to go home. Oh, yeah. You want, you know, yeah. You, when you're out there, you're getting battered. You want to come back and like chill. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, oh, my God, I got another eight shows to go. Not even, it's like 15 shows to go. But then my you, knee's killing me. God, I got to do this. I got to sleep in this bus. This guy's annoying me. You know what I mean? Like, but you're doing what you love, and you're doing it's crazy, man. That balance, man. That, but if you didn't have the option to go out there and complain yeah. about what you were doing, <laughs> yeah. you'd, you'd be in a bad spot. If we weren't going to run into each other at some point this summer in a field in the middle of Europe, yeah. eating a bunch of mystery food, you know? Yeah, you look back on it as great times. Yeah, you know, it is, they are great times. Yeah. I know we've been blessed. I know people say that word. You shouldn't say the word blessed, but I feel like you pay your dues, you work hard to get where you're at, but it's a blessing to still have that happening. Yeah, you know I mean, I, like, I was just saying this, I did Isaac's podcast, uh, the Danny Diablo, yeah. Diablo's Den, and I was saying how like, you know, I could be standing before the man, you know what I mean? After I pass, yeah. and I could see him saying, you know, you've done well. You sang songs, like we spoke of earlier, you sang songs that people related to, you touched people's hearts and, and, and gave them some drive, Meanwhile, you cleansed yourself of of your early trauma. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. Maybe, well, maybe, pat me on the head. Tell me I did a good job as Craig. Maybe Big Charlie will introduce true. you. Yeah. Maybe Big Charlie will introduce me. You no, know, it's wait, really wait, true. Wait, waiting at the gate, bouncing. Yeah. yeah. Like maybe you know, I'm thinking like it's a it's a. I think we did well, like we talked about earlier. You could have turned out way different, man, with way, what you went through. Yeah. We're not supposed to like take over the world. We're not supposed to get ultra rich. We're supposed to touch each other. In a gentle way. <laughs> wait, a minute. wait a minute, that didn't come out right. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Toby. So Sorry, bad. Toby. No, you know what I mean? You're supposed to touch each other's hearts and Yeah, so we're supposed people. to touch each other. Not physically, and, 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 mentally, no, we're supposed, we're supposed to. We're supposed to touch. No, it does get lonely on two or something. Well, <laughs> we're supposed to touch each other and, 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 and spark some kind of yeah. emotion, yeah. emotional response that goes into action. We're supposed to, to, to you know, uh, give each other uh, things to things to think about that yeah. will that will grow into into things that are positive and and you know yeah. beyond the typical things you'd expect. We're supposed to go a little further and and, and try a little harder. And we tra- travel around the world and we get to we get to play music to rooms full of people that are basically just their own version of us going on the same yes. journey. You we're know, really true, the same music. We're communicating same. on a human level. Yeah, which yeah. is which is really. A, a, a noble thing to do. And it's what people need always. Yeah, it never goes away. People it's always a, need it. It's a noble thing. We we for for forty five minutes, maybe we make people's lives better. Maybe they get to take the night off. You ever been? Oh, it's <laughs> two now. <laughs> you, you you you've been up there thinking like, God, I'm on tour so long, I can't wait to go home, and you feel like you're going through the motions, and then like you're doing it, and you're like, oh, and then you'll be in your bunk at night sleeping, the bus rattling, you'll be like, van rattling, you'll be like, you know something like. Step it back. Think about what you're doing. Get yeah. back to strip all the. It's hard when you're in it though. Strip all the pain in the ass you're dealing with right now, and how your back hurts, and all this BS, and how you need to go. Uh, think about what you're doing and when you started this and where you are now. And yeah. you smile and you think, you know, this is great, good, okay. Yeah. You get back to the root of it and you think, I'm um, okay. I'm doing the right thing. Yes. Yeah. I, I, you humble yourself. You're like not humble yourself. You just strip away all the temporary discomfort. Because I could like, sit here right now with Adam and look at him in the face and say, "Dude, I can't wait. We have all these shows coming up this summer. So excited. We're going to be the bus for 21 days. I guarantee on day 17. I guarantee you guys the day be 10. Shot. Looking at we back to Adam's like, we're like this. I, I can just sucks. But right now, but looking at be, not being in it, you yeah, know, it's different. Yeah, yeah. You know, but, it's yeah. so crazy. You have shot when you're out yeah. there. I'm looking so forward to now. Yeah. But yeah, 21 days sounds awesome yeah. now. I would say if it's 21 days in a van, we'd be having oh, a very no. different Oh, no. It takes discussion. years off your life. Yeah. Years. Freddie Mabel said that once. Yeah. Like, don't ever tour in a van in Europe. It takes years off your life. It does. They tour in vans in Europe all the time. But they do both too, though. But yeah. I think they do shorter but ones But you know what I'm vans. saying now? Like right now, it's great. Yeah. And we're together. And I see you like, I'll see you pacing backstage, trying to find a gym or something. Yeah, like trying to do something. Those 23 hours before you play, it's like but, so but, but much I, shit. I feel like right now we've been off, uh, we've been off for seven months. Really? Nah, nah. Wait, we were five months. We, we last shows were November, December, no, November, October. Right? No, no. When was the East we played Co- Cali show in October? Was that October, November? Yeah, October. All right, so October, November, December, January, February. This is March. Yeah. five months off. It'll be six, wow. seven, eight months. Wow, it's a long time. And guess what? We I haven't ain't had eight practice. I haven't had eight months <laughs> off. In, I haven't had eight months off in my whole life. <laughs> He said, "We ain't gonna no, practice." No, no, you don't practice. No, anymore. you shop. Well, you, 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 you rehearse. You jam when you're writing an album. Otherwise, you don't. Practice. Yeah. Otherwise, that's the best part because you step on stage and it's it's all new again. Yeah, it's fresh. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean, and that's the best. We like we we understand each other though. There's like a connection here with yeah. other people at tour. You understand this thing that we do. Yeah. Other people don't understand that. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean much. Like it doesn't make them you your relationship to them. It just it's like. Like I look you in the eye, it's there. I'm like, okay, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. You even know even, I mean? even, Mick know. Ja- even Mick Jagger shits in a porta potty once in a while. Yeah, there's like that yeah. understanding yeah. of like, oh, he's been through this. He yeah. knows yeah. what this is. Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, I want to thank I want to thank you for uh, you know the heart, the tough love you gave when he moved to New York, like the Gatia games love and, you, the poke, and the poke and the poking. It made me a stronger person, gave me thicker skin. And I realize looking back on it now that it was all out. Of, I know it was out of love, you know, and it continues out throughout our life. We still fuck with each other here and there, but yeah. it's all out of love. Like if something happened to us, God forbid, we'd be fucking devastated. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If somebody fucked you, we always have each other's back. Yeah. It's always it's that been other like guy that. in my in my thing. You gotta watch it's, out it's, for. It's, it's, it's <laughs> <all>. <laughs> <laughs> figure out which one. It, but it's always been like that. You know what I mean? Though it's always been this tough love, ball breaking. Shit talking, all this shit. I even talked to Jimmy about it on the podcast the other day, and he's like, "Dude, I, I talked about you on stage last week, made fun of you for being PM main straight edge. This joke, but it's all like this yeah. love, and it's like it's this New York thing. I feel like it's no other scenes like that. Uh, it's it's a tough love, man. And, and for me, you any, got some of that from us too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any any time a bass player jumps off a monitor in hardcore. Or wears you know camo shorts or sneakers. It's all you know. They're all they're all giving a little nod to Craig ahead. Oh sure. my god! <laughs> yeah, this guy had it. This guy got he got battered early and off in this one. Yeah, Adam he took some shots. He did. Early he takes some shots. He took some licks. You could but see I came out, you could right? see the like the slightly glassy eyes. Or something. But look how good he looks now, though. <laughs> yeah, the guys are. The I'm guys a late like a, fucking. Beast. I'm a late bloomer. This guy's like a, talking of he's talking like Adonis. He's the Adonis record. of the hardcore Goodbye. scene. Huh? He's he the Adonis of the hardcore scene. Oh, thank you. Thank but you, he he came he came yeah he came a long that way is too man too kind yeah too kind if, if, if you guys seen Adam a while Adam, Adam trains people and he's in great shape he's forty six years old oh got the guy's a full, like a Greek got god got a freight full of hair 
Good body. He's in good shape. What about the head? What are you saying? Like, oh, his hair looks great. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm chilling. <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> and real quick, stick with all. I used to break my balls my entire life and told me that I was going bald. I shaved my head with a Bic razor for like five years. <laughs> this is great. And now I'm looking at Craig. He's completely bald. Completely bald. But they made fun of me so. He had great hair too. And I remember I you ripped hair. on yeah, stage with the yeah, camel yeah, pants. Yeah. Young, hey, Craig, young Craig ahead. Yeah, what happened? A fox. Young Craig ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, fuck. But you know, damaged. Def- doing what happened? Damage. What happened? Definitely. They had me. I had a complex that I was completely bald. So I shaved my ball for years. Skin bald, and now like the old game. Old game. But now I get the same widow's peak, and yeah, it's true. It held up pretty well. Thank young, you, man. Thank you. I know you're trying you know? to get me your stupid club. I'll never be in your club. But stupid um, club. You yeah, know what I'm talking about, Craig. It's been awesome. I got the least hair here. It's all right. <laughs> It's been a wonderful discussion. We did we co- so. Craig, we think we good. We could cover a lot of good things. I think it, I think it went well. I just hope really, I didn't babble too much. No, he did great, dude. We told good stories. And I need, I need your, yeah, I'll do it right now. Yeah. I need his autograph. We'll have to, we'll do it's it. like a, we had like a boys club vibe going a little bit. That's what I'm trying to say. Maybe a little too much boys club vibe. You know what I mean? We're just talking. But we're man. just talking. You know? People just want to hear real conversations. That, that There's no agenda. We're just talking about life. We yep. met each other back then. All the stuff you've done in your life. Adam Blake's here. Listen, any t- any time. Like, We're not I'll, perfect people. If dude. you ever want to do this again in a yeah. different format with other people mixed yeah, in, yeah, totally. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk some scratch. Well, dude, Craig, you, you've been through a lot, and I'm glad you opened up about the shit you've been through and therapy and all that stuff. It's important, man. Absolutely, absolutely. Because you got to fucking you got to be good in your head too. You know, you know, you know what it is. You can never pretend things don't mean something when they do, because yeah. you're only hurting yourself. It's all going to come back to you. It's going to echo back to you. You, you might as well you can't take, hide from it. For, yeah, you got to talk up when you're when you have trauma and pain. You have to actually face it. Because if you try to run from it, you're going to wind up doing drugs. Yep. You know, or... Say, it's safe to say that music saved all of our lives, you know? Yeah. In a sense. You're going abu- to abuse yourself... Uh, right, Adam? ...in one way or another. Yeah. 100%. Dude, without music... Without music, yes. Sometimes I imagine a door number two. Yeah. Are we this? Yeah, man. So sometimes I imagine a door number two where I never got the call to go join Shelter. Yeah. Like, like it had... had a, or, or if I had got the call and I had said no. Mm-hmm. And it terrifies me. It's a factory worker. Oh, just where yeah, life would have been. Just, just because I look at the life that I've been fortunate enough to lead versus where my life was heading, if that yeah. kind of wild left turn hadn't come out, come at me. Yeah, man. Man, I I, I, I'm thankful for that. It all day. happens for a reason, man. Yeah, yeah, I have no idea what would happen to me. I probably would have been doing drugs and had some crappy job. Who knows? Then again, maybe the light would have shined through me again at some point, just through a different medium, but who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Music therapy really opens you up though yeah it takes a long time and but a it, lot of miles and a terrible and, 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 and it's still and it still continues it's, it still continues still continues yeah. yeah so the people listen we want to know we appreciate playing music we appreciate all the people Absolutely. all the people supported our bands unconditionally for many many years we love what we do you know it, it is you know it's a blessing and a curse it's a sacrifice we leave our families we miss all kinds of things happening in the real world at yeah. home but we love doing it we're lucky to still do it we thank you guys for doing it. people Dude. who are growing up with us bringing their kids to our shows Fucking, they're fifty years old coming to our shows. Like, it's do awesome. your thing. You don't have to fit in. Be yourself. Yeah, you could be you. You be the individual you are and shine and and do your thing. Don't let, don't let anybody take you down because you're not quote unquote normal. Live your life. Be proud. Do your thing. Never give up. That's right. Thank you, Craig, for being Absolutely. here. It's fucking you, awesome, man. This was awesome. Nice. Thank you. Some Tony Robbins <laughs> shit right here. <laughs> Thank you. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Um, please rate review. Uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet to this podcast please do that and whatever platform you are listening to this on i'm glad you found me you can rate me and review me on there also so thank you guys sincerely for the support i cannot wait for you guys to the next one